It's that boy Fred, host of FanView Podcast. Tune in to the NOTN app. We days, 3.30 for the FanView Podcast. Go to NewOrleansTalkNetwork.com to watch more episodes of FanView Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and watch. This is Felton Huggins Jr. I'm the head football coach at Kentucky State University, and we're here at the FanView Podcast. But whatever choice you make, we have to be good with the consequences, good, bad, and differently. As long as we good with the consequences, whatever it is, you know you got me. I'm going to help you. We're going to learn from it. We're going to grow from it. And we're going to continue moving on. But a lot of times, our kids don't understand the choices that they make not only affect us, but they affect the people around us. For real. And that's the most important. So, like, when I tell kids I give them money, like, hey, when I take your money, if I take your scholarship, it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to really hurt you. It's going to hurt your mom. It's going to hurt your dad because now you put them in a position to now where they already – School is high as I don't know what now. Yep. There, the portal is crazy. Like, the odds of getting in college now are so slim. I tell my kids all the time, like, it ain't hard for me to go find a kid. And I'm not trying to. I want you here. Right. But if I can't, like, it's kids in the DMs right now mm-hmm. just itching for an opportunity. <laughs> Special guest, man, Kentucky State head football coach Felton Huggins, man. Appreciate you coming on the on the Fan View podcast, man. Ben, Ben, talking about getting you on, man. I'm glad you was able to get down here and, and come on here and fellowship with us, bro. And uh, we always like to start our podcast. Oh, we gonna get right into it about your journey, bro. That's how we always like to start the Fan View podcast off, and you know, let our viewers understand who Felton Huggins is, man. You know, I've been knowing you since 2003 at Southeastern. When you was cutting up being all American, but but before you before you start talking though, let let me let me read off a, a few of his accolades. If you people that's watching not familiar with my dog, man, holds a school record at Southeastern University for receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns, and was a two time All American, man. Like the the name speaks for itself. If you a Louisiana head that was following college football back then from that two thousand three to that two thousand six two thousand seven era. You know who Felton Huggins is in the state of Louisiana, man. But um, oh, so <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but yeah, man. Uh, you know, start it off, man. Let us know, man, when you first fell in love, fell in love with the game of football, man, and, and how it got you prepared in your career, being you know a, a head coach at Kentucky State University, man. Well, first and foremost, man, I just want to say, Jeremiah, man, appreciate you just giving me the time to be on your podcast, man. At no the doubt. end of the day, it's a blessing, man, that anything that we ever get a chance to do and to shine a light, again, not on me. It ain't never about me. It's always people help me along the way to get to where I was going. So it's never about me. It's always about the journey and the path that we go to get to where we're trying to go, man. So I'm just appreciative of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, So, man, kind of how I fell in love with football, man. I fell in love with it at an early age. My dad was a coach. Um, my whole parents are in education, you know, so that was always instilled in me early. Um, I can remember as a little young kid and my dad had football practice or basketball practice. I mean, we always had to play every sport. My dad was a softball coach slash baseball coach as well. And so just watching him as a young kid, uh, and I always knew I wanted to be a coach as a young age. My dad, you know, that was like the time when you could have a paddle. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can paddle kids back mm. then. And so I just, after, when I was young, man, and, and just seeing that and just, all my whole family, if you know about Huggins, and I, again, again, it's not about me, it's about my family. Where we're from, man, like, we just breed athletes. Like, it's just, that's just what we do down there. We're from the country. Uh, everything, I mean, from the home of Doug Williams. But it's also not only just Doug Williams. We have a lot, a lot of, of highly skilled athletes that are from where I'm from, man. So, it was instilled in us, man, playing basketball on dirt courts and playing football on anywhere you got it. But we got an open field, like, so that's when they fell in love with the compassion, with the competitive nature, with the team camaraderie in it, and just the overall fun of the game, man. So um, just learning from my pops and just instilling those things in me and instilling what it means to be a coach and just also loving the game. That's what it was always about for me. And then when you started playing high school football, when did that light switch, when did that light go off in your head when you was like, man, I think I got a chance to go do this on the next level and be pretty good at it? Man, you know what? It's kind of funny. It didn't really go off in the way that you think it did. At the end of the day, like, I just love sports. Like, where we were from, like, you just, whatever season it is, that's the sport you play. Mm-hmm. If it's football season, you play football. And I think that's a Louisiana thing, too. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it keeps mm-hmm. us out of trouble. 
Right. You know, trouble's always around us. Like I always tell my kids, life out the door waiting on you. Just it's sitting there hovering around waiting on you. And so just it's basketball season, you pick up the ball and you hoop. If it's track, softball, whatever sport it is, whatever the majority of the neighborhood is playing, that's what you play. And so, man, in high school, like, I didn't have the best of high school career. Like, we had a lot of change over as a head coach. Uh, I was always a quarterback my whole life. So, when I got to Southeastern Germany, I don't know this. Like, my first time playing receiver was in 03. Never knew that. Like, I never played receiver before. Um, but, you know, you kind of play it in the yard when you're like, hey, pick up a run, you got to right. catch the ball when you right. get hit. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, it was just, man, just whatever sport it was, that's what I I, I – I gravitated to, but football was always my passion. Like, I mean, I remember I used to do, I used to thought I was going to be Mel Kiper. Like, <laughs> the draft, man, and just literally look at pros and cons of every position and just see if I can kind of pick who what I think would be the first guy would be that'll benefit my team. And so, um, man, high school wise, it wasn't, it wasn't as what I thought it was, but I was always solid. But uh, just from our path and the coaches that we had in our time and the school we was at, it was kind of rough, but we always had the best talent. If you ask anybody about Northeast High School and where we're from, mm-hmm. like I say, talent is there. That was never an issue. Um, the issue was a lot of different things that, you know, as a young guy, we didn't know now, but I wish now those are the things I'm hoping I'm trying to change as I continue to grow and get older. Now, talk about your college playing career. You know, you started off at Grambling, you know, with a, in a prolific offense you, with uh, Bruce Eugene. Yeah. Melvin Spears, you know, was was the was the head yeah. coach. Um, then you transferred to you know mm-hmm. an upstart program in Southeast and still put up numbers under the great Hal Hal Mummy. Just talk about when it clicked for you, like Jeremiah has said, um, that you might have a chance to continue your career outside of the NCAA. I'm going to try to not make this as long-winded, but man, it it <laughs> it's funny. Like when I went to Grambling, I wasn't in the clearinghouse on time. So, you know, at the time, we didn't really know about Clearhouse. Right. Saying, well, right. A lot of people kind of, I was part of the Prop 48. Me and Jeremiah and you were talking about, we was Prop 48. So, I was a part of that crew because I didn't get in the Clearhouse on time. And at that time, Clearhouse was super backlog. Like, yeah. you probably ain't never mm-hmm. get your clearance until the end of the season. So, that first year, like, I literally, our Prop 48 team at Grambling is probably the most talented Prop 48 team ever. And we all play intramural football. Mm-hmm. Like, Everybody, Moses, Moses Harris and Jason Hatch, who was a third round pick. Oh, we was all, we all played flag in the mirror. We, we was props. So we could not lift with the team. We couldn't do nothing. Right. And so, uh, you know, going there and just being at Gramlin, I love Gramlin. I don't get it twisted. Like Gramlin is, is what instilled to me to want to go to H, get back to HBCU to be a coach. Like I always tell people, mm. I didn't, I'm, I was never trying to run. I was never running away from HBCUs. I was trying to run to it. Like, I always wanted to go back and be a coach and give back to my people. And so, uh, but Grambling for me, my whole family went to Grambling. Like, I've been doing Grambling my whole life. My mom, my dad, my aunt, my aunt, six foot four. She scored 100 points at Grambling. Dang. Back in the day, like, if you know anybody about S.B. Huggins, like, she was an animal. She'll tell you, too, to this day. And she'll actually think she can still put her points on me. But so, I mean, going there, but Grambling just wasn't the place for me. But I met a lot of people that Bruce Eugene, who we played in NFL Europe together. So leaving there, uh, it wasn't for me. Um, so I ended up transferring going to Southeastern. People don't realize it, Jonah. Jeremiah knows Southeastern didn't even have football. Right. right. So I was there. I was running track. Fast forward, y'all don't realize this. I was running track. You know, our track team was this. Me on our 4x4 four four team. Jacoby Jones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jacoby Jones. Uh, for for, for oh, y'all that don't know who Jacoby Jones is, played, side note played for the Baltimore, Baltimore <laughs> Ravens. Mm-hmm. Played an eight. Super Bowl champion. Super Bowl played a, a, right here from hometown New Orleans, man. And Jacoby was our relay guy. So it was me, Jacoby, Lazaric, uh, Kyle, who, uh, yep. Lazaric and Z, and uh, uh, I forgot his last name, Some, Sydney Dancer. And actually, small world, his brother is uh, one of the winners high school head coaches in Kentucky. Uh, and I met him, first guy I plugged with when I got the job at KSU. Oh, and so we all ran track together, four by four team. Jacoby, like literally, just think of Jacoby would have ever came out there with us because he was gonna come out after I got out. He there. was play, he was playing flag with he us. Was though. Playing flag with y'all. I used to go to the games. He used to be crazy. Yeah. After our practice, we head to the enemy. Yeah, yeah. We used <laughs> got that cut up, man. <laughs> and so getting the Grambling, man. I'm at Southeast and I'm running track, but I'm watching the football team. I'm watching Hutch. I'm watching Jeff. I'm watching all my bros out there. And me and Jacoby sitting there. We all play football, and we all just sitting there like, man, we need to get back out there. And one day, like the track coach knew. He just kept being on us, like, hey, y'all, Coach Brady, good guy, great guy. Man, y'all need to get back to your track, to get to your practice, get to everything. And then one day, I just, he kept bothering me, and I just said, forget it. 
Like, I'm going to go tell Coach Mummy, let him come run, let me run a 40 for him. Let me see what happened. I think I ran, like, some like, high 4-4 or something like that. And then he kind of came and Coach Roller came talked to me, and it was just like, hey, uh, what position you play? I said, I play quarterback. He said, well, you ain't playing that here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, what can I play? He said, you can play receiver. And Coach Goff and them got to me, and they was throwing a water bottle to me the whole time. Let Coach Goff tell the story. I dropped it, but I caught every one of them. <laughs> and, uh, man, the rest is kind of history. I learned as I grow. I'm a person of be where your feet are and just take each day as it is. Don't run anybody else's race. Just run your race. So, for me, it was just always just trying to continue playing the game that I love. If you play the game that you love, good things will happen to you because you always playing it for the right reasons and the right things. And so that's what I always did, man. Like, I just went out and competed and had fun doing it. Like, I wasn't – I mean, Jay know me on campus, man. I didn't really talk or do much. Right. I just love ball. Like, I was probably the most quiet All-American you could ever see. Yeah, you but were chilling. Me, I was just chill. I just love ball, man. Like, and just going out there and, and – and, again, I always tell guys, I wouldn't have got to where I was this, to this point because of the guys around me. Like, we just talked about it. Hutch Gonzalez, Jeffrey Howard was probably, probably, the, probably don't run the fastest 40, but one of the hardest working dudes I ever Jaron Pierce. Jaron Pierce, who owns Gym A Equip Fitness. Like, over and over, Josh Taylor, and, and, and the list goes on and on and on of the receivers we had there, man. And those guys pushed me, and I always like to say, I wasn't the reason I got there. You got those guys are the reason I got there, man. It was just because we all pushed each other. It was a brotherhood. And it's kind of hard. You don't see that nowadays in ball. But that's some of the things when you have that camaraderie, like everybody wins, man. Mm-hmm. Like, and so that was what it was about for me. So that's when I knew, like, and then I started getting calls. And, and I was like, I still didn't believe it. Mm-hmm. I was just like, okay, I'll just keep balling. Like, keep playing ball. And just, hey, whatever happens, happens. And so that's how I always looked at things, man. Just just ran my race and just try to figure it out as, as the day went along and just make choices. Everybody man. wins until y'all play all corn. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, we definitely got to have a side note at some point about that. <laughs> oh, man, I remember, you know, even though I, I, I ended up not playing at Southeastern, but I always stayed close to the game. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of my close friends, Brennan Harris and Norman Randall and a lot yeah. of them, boy, Romales Mill. Them boy, you know, we we always would be sitting around just talking about mm-hmm. the upcoming team y'all playing this week. Practice mm-hmm. when y'all went to camp at uh Camp Abbey, yeah, Camp Abbey, <laughs> Camp Abbey. When you, when they took y'all phones, y'all had no oh, phones and stuff baby. like that, man. And so, <laughs> uh, I always stayed close to what y'all had going on. I don't think I ever missed a home game. I don't think you when, did, when I was at South Easter, man. And I remember them talking about how raw you were, and you had all the talent in the world, but you were still trying to figure it out. Yes. I remember traveling to Lake Charles when it was nationally ranked. <laughs> and that was your coming out party, bro. Yeah. 200 and what, 60 yards receiving, 13 receptions. Y'all upset at Magnese. Yeah. Nobody gave y'all a shot going into that game. No. And I think that's when the light went off in your head on the college ranks. Right. Man, take me back to, you know, like you say, man, you you came in, came ran a forty for half moment. You wanted to play quarterback. You told you couldn't play quarterback. Mm-hmm. You played receiver. It was a it was a process. Yeah. And then you figured it out, and you end up being a two time All American, bro, and and holding three different records, there, man. Yeah. Take me to the through the hard work and, and just that journey of that, man. That's all you said. Nah, no doubt, man. I think for that year, that was going into our junior year, and that was the year like we got another year back. And we all kind of knew the offense. Like, that was the first thing. Like, that whole summer, like, I think kids don't understand, like, championships or greatness or whatever you're going to do is always built in the summer. Like, them hard months. Like, ain't nobody up there. We all broke. (laughs) Like, we all ain't got no money. For real. That time Hurricane Katrina hadn't came yet. So, hey, we all ain't had no money. And we just grinded it out. And each and every day, we got two or three days in. Like, we would get up in the morning and go catch. Then we would run routes, go get a lift in. We all had jobs. Some of us was in summer school. Then we would come back and get a 707 session late in the afternoon. Like, that year, man, we knew the offense like the back of our head, man. Like, it was nothing. And Coach Mummy will tell you this, and Martin will too. Like, at certain points, man, like, he would just call a formation in, and Martin would call a play. Like, we all had a, a relationship with Martin. And even for us, me and him, like, we even had a better one, like, Team started trying to play, shade me over top, or wouldn't let me get deep. So he already knew, like, I was going to snap it off at a certain amount of yardage. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's one thing, like, now in the game, like, our kids don't understand, like, you got to be a student of the game. Like, understanding, it didn't matter what position I played or what position none of us played. We knew every part of the offense. 
So just if we had a guy hurt, we can plug another guy. I just say, hey Jeff, come over here. Next man up. Just hush. Next man up. Like that was how it was. And so going into that season, we first we played um first game of the season, we played Arkansas Monticello. You had two hundred yards in that game. I had two hundred that game. I had eleven for two sixty six and two touch. Again, I still didn't it, it didn't really hit me, man. I just to me You're it was balling. Just, I was just having fun, man. Just playing a game that Man, every kid in their, in their whole life just a dream of playing. Like so, then it came to Magnese. They were number six, and a lot of our good friends here might know this. Like, are still like that next year. Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Magnese got displaced. Mm-hmm. So we like a lot of them cats on that team. Like, I'm still solid with to this day, and a lot of our team is because they stayed on our campus. People don't know this. Like, mm-hmm. we we housed them for a whole semester, and so like Derek Brown, Carlise Franklin. Marcus Brown, Jonathan Z9, like all those cats. When I went to coach at Magnese, I knew I had a relationship with all those guys. So I was telling Coach Gobble, I know half the alumni. Mm-hmm. They were here with us. And so they all knew me and it kind of helped and made it fresh. So we went into that game, man. They were ranked. Like they was just off a, a semifinal run, yeah. I think. Yeah. The year before. That's what Magnese was Magnese. Yeah, they were Magnese. Like, yes. I realized, flashback pause, like Magnese was the power. Yes. Like I tell everybody, it's like, from the early 90s, hell, I just met Chad Pennington, who was a high school coach in Lexington, and uh, he was in, well, him and Randy Moss was at Marshall. Yeah. They played Magnese for the semifinal. They beat Magnese, but Magnese was there. Damn, and I don't even so, remember that. Yes, yes, go look it up. Marshall, yeah. uh, Randy Moss was there, and Chad Pennington was his quarterback. So, man, like, they were deep power. So, us going in there, and it was it was crazy. Like, yeah. night game, yes. Cowboys Stadium. Yep. Like, you already know what time it is. Pokes up. Go pokes up. You already know all cards. <laughs> okay. We play them every year. <laughs> And so we go into that game, man, and just it started kind of flat. You know, we I actually think I caught a ball and I, I caught a deep one and I fumbled and I gave it to him and and then they went down and drove. And so it was like, oh snap, like we about to it's Magnese, they about to put us I put it on us again. Right. And then next thing you know, like, man, the light came on and we just drive at the drive. I think I hit him deep. Then Hutch hit him for one and Perk, I think he scored. And then I hit another one. I I I think, if I remember correctly, I was done at the third. Like, we had to put the route on. And, mm-hmm. Man. It was like 50 to 17. 50 to 17. And we knew the game was over. Like, I still have this picture to this day. Perk was, had the fun pom-poms, and he had his hands out like that, and he got a picture of him kind of teasing the crowd. <laughs> and that was, and we had just beat them, and they was exiting the stadium, and we had just knocked them off. And that year, man, I was, I think those first two, three games of the season, I led the, the whole nation in receiving. That's what coming out with Vincent Jackson. Mm-hmm. Play for the Tampa Bay. Yep. Man, y'all played them, play. Northern Colorado. We played yep. Northern Colorado. Like, man, like, and that's when we knew the light hit on, man. And uh, it was just, again, but that was only a credit to the work that we put in ahead of time. It wasn't waiting till the week of or waiting till camp. Like, we decided, like, hey, the summer, we're going to grind it out, man, like all of us. And we did. And that's why we were the number one passing offense in the nation at that time. I remember being at that game at McNeese. And because – Two of my two of my friends I went to the game with, they went to Glen Oaks. And uh uh Damon and yeah. Kevin Coates. Yeah, I know Kevin. Yeah, yeah Kevin yeah. ran track with us too. Yeah, yeah, so it did. So it did. <laughs> so we track. we all rolled together to the game. I forgot the two cats that played with Magnese that went to Glen Oaks with them. That was uh Roderick Royal. Yep. Um yep. started that play that Florida transferred in and yep. one more guy. I forgot the other one. But yeah. so they talking shit. <laughs> I'm talking shit. <laughs> so when so he's in Beetle. Man, I'm talking about we in a sea of Magnese fans. Yeah, it was. Man, it was man, the people, man, the people wanted my head up and up. <laughs> they wanted my head up and up. <laughs> and look, I'm going to be real with you. I was super nervous coming into the game because Magnese was so good for so long. And They were. You know, I think they was number seven. They, they were They, they were, were number, three, actually, three if I'm correct, they were number three, I think. Yeah. I, it I, was three in one poll, poll and six the, in another. Yeah, one. it was yeah. something like that, bro. So, but I knew that the type of offense y'all was running, Y'all could go in there and score some points. Yeah. I just didn't know if the defense was going to be able to do what they did. They held them to 17. Well, it kind of panicked because, like, after a while, they was playing this kind of zone, and and then next thing you know, they scored, and then they kind of just thought, like, hey, we're just going to heat y'all up. And we already knew, like, me and Martin knew, like, I could literally, I wouldn't have to give him a signal. He would just give me a head nod, and he knew, okay, hey, they playing zero. Are they doing this? Like, I'm going to do this. And that was it. Like, there was no signal. There was no nothing. He just had a feel, like, hey, I'm going to snap it off. I'm going to take the middle and do this. And after that, it was over with. Side note, I can tell you, so when I got the job at Magnese and our SID, Matthew Barnett, I did not know this when I got there. He came and he said, Felness, man, he was there when we played them. He was like, Fel, man, it's, it's happy to finally meet you, man. He 
He said, I want to tell you something crazy. I said, what? He said, uh, you know you still own the stadium record at Magnet State for the uh, yardage and touchdowns in our stadium? <laughs> it's the, and I didn't go to school there. <laughs> yeah. that's bad. So that was just like, yeah. I was like, man, and kind of that's how I kind of, that was my introduction to like a lot of those alumni and some of the greatest alumni uh, that you can ever can meet. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I went to Southeast and I love our alumni as well, but you can tell why like Cowboy Nation is, is something else, man, because they ride or die. Yeah. They embraced me too. So even though I was outside and we had a lot of battles, mm-hmm. you know, so I mean, Magnus was our second, probably our rival the next to you guys, man. Right. So. Talk, right. talk about our, our game, because <laughs> it'll both get in, and I, it's like I can tell a secret now because we ain't playing. Oh no doubt, because because all we did was our second half adjustment. Both games we went from man to man and we played cover seven the whole Y'all did. the, the Y'all whole did. whole second half. And the first time I could tell, like <laughs> Trey was struggling, so he didn't know where the drop was coming. He didn't know where the drop was coming from, and then the second game. The second game, I, y'all just get—I don't know how to this so day. So we played y'all three times. Yeah, I'm t- the 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 third one y'all finally got. Third one we got y'all. I think that was at the COVID. Mm-hmm. I think y'all was y'all had a quarter. Donna was just done. Yeah, and yeah. y'all had a new quarterback. Who uh, wasn't uh? Who was the QB at we, that time? Yeah, um, it was, it was, it was a young two, guy. It was a two. It was a two quarterback system. He was actually a four star coming out. Uh, it was um, it, it was. It was his last name Hobson? Yeah, Trey Tony Tony Hobson. Mm-hmm. Yes, so yes. Like, it was like, it was like. The team wanted one kid, Oliver Bolden. Well, he was the high ranked guy, and but y'all wanted. I forgot the other guy who y'all wanted to start. We wanted Oliver. We was like the team wanted Oliver Bolden. Yes. like he been there. With he us. had been there a long he, time. He came there oh three, like he, like he was just a, he was yeah. He was an athlete. He been in the system for a minute. Then, uh, but the the OC, you know, like Tony was his guy. You know, like yeah. both and both of them was good. It's just like we we thought like we was ready for. The athletes we had, uh-huh. and you put that type of athlete that Slim was, because like Slim, like he trains quarterbacks now. He like he really he, he um he he trained Michael Vick. He was training Pat White. Um, mm-hmm. you know, like that, you know he he and, that, and fast forward, Pat White ended up being OC at all points. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like so, <laughs> world, did not know that. Yeah, yeah, did not know that. Mm-hmm. He was yeah. up. A, man, Pat came there twice. Yeah. Yeah, came Wait, well, he, he first time was under Hobson's. Yeah, and the second time came back with um McNeil. Yep. And um, so so like it was that 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 seesaw, but we knew, like as a defense, we knew like yeah, this we gonna get them three because the first two y'all y'all gave to us. We, so we definitely gave. So we played y'all three times, and O three we gave y'all that one. Like now y'all had the better record. Um, y'all were actually I think y'all were favorite. Mm-hmm. We came into y'all first of all. We love playing y'all because that was our only time we get to hear black band. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. That was the only time we got to hear black Dang. band. So for us, you know, b- growing up in that culture, like, and we didn't have really the best high school band in high school, so growing up in HBCU culture, like, we all wanted to hear that. Like, hey, lovely thing, talking out the side of your neck, uh-huh. like, all that. So that was going to get us grown, too. Mm. So we were hype coming down there to you guys, and we actually led y'all. And uh, and then we end up giving up the deep ball. I think it was a post to Courtney because I actually I think I I think I caught two to no, one touchdown that game. I forgot I who it was. It, it might have been two. We had a good game. I think that was Martin's first year, and so we played good that game. But we gave it because Martin started as a true freshman. Martin started as a true freshman. The second year, we I, I can't remember correctly, but I know Martin didn't play as good as he typically would. That was like. That we threw the, like three or four like the picks. Four, that was like the four. It was like it was like six turnovers. Yeah, it was like, y'all, y'all we had fumbled. Four picks, we had fumbles. a couple picks, but we end up still losing by like one score. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were in the game. I think y'all would never put it away. We kept it there, but every time we had a drive, it was a pick. And I think that was the only game I did not go for a hundred on you guys. Um, and then we played y'all year two, um, no year three. Um, yeah, we we kind of beat y'all, but it was always a battle. We always knew first of all y'all were going to be physical. Like, so we had to come with it. We knew y'all was going to talk a lot of straight up crap. Like, it was going to some shit talking. Uh, and we knew that y'all were going to play hard for four quarters. Like, they told us, like, and we were air raid team, so we weren't known to be physical. But it showed that, like, man, when y'all was coming down here, like, it didn't matter. Like, we came up with you guys. And y'all beat us in the series out of two out of three guys, <laughs> man. So, nah, that, that kind of hurt to this day. But we beat everybody else, though. Prayer View and Valley, we got them. Right. Just could not get y'all, man. <laughs> man. The L Ray was kind of, it was known if you was in the football world, but yes. to a lot of outsider people, then it was it was unfamiliar with L Ray. Uh, man, talk about playing for somebody like Hal Mummy, man, who 
is one of the Godfathers, mm-hmm. if not the Godfather. He create, yeah, he must have created of it. He created this, right, if, right. If you look at his tree, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Um, you know, playing for somebody like who's the Godfather of the Air Raid, man, like how mummy who never wore a headset, <laughs> known for the famous towel around his neck he throughout the, the whole towel. game. How gonna keep the towel? Yeah, and 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 just go, he's gonna have a prolific offense year in and year out. His quarterback play is gonna be phenomenal, mm-hmm. and his receivers are gonna be precise and on point. Mm-hmm. Talk about playing for somebody like that, man, and, and how much you learned throughout your years playing for Hell Mummy in Southeastern. Nah, no doubt, man. First and foremost, man, again, never never playing receiver, never playing receiver and being a quarterback all my life and now getting into that offense. For me, it kind of it was an easy transition because I already knew what it looks like from the back end because mm-hmm. I played quarterback. So I knew how to understand coverage. I knew how to understand like spacing and things like that. But now getting in that offense and now understanding like, okay, within the air raid, the air raid is literally you're trying to affect five areas of the field. You're trying to affect the deep third the middle third and you know the short third and so just i loved it and again i mean i love it a lot first of all it got me to all the heights that i've got to be able to play in the nfl for a little bit and then now i actually i'm an air raid guy like i'm part of that tree too mm-hmm. like i'm a descendant of how son matt matt taught me everything i know with also within playing in it mm-hmm. and so uh man just getting there and understanding like the air raid and how he kind of fruition with it was just like it's all about reps like, it's kind of that, like, that Kobe Bryant, like, 10,000-hour rule. Mm-hmm. Like, the more and more you do things, it comes repetitive nature. Like, that's all the air raid is. It's just reps. Like, everybody catches the ball. Everybody throws it. Like, every quarterback throws a route, a pass concept, or a pass route. Um, Everybody does everything, and it's just multiple times you do it, and you get conditioning within the, within the practice structure because you run so many routes. Muscle and, memory. Yeah, muscle memory. And then now – the added element a lot of guys now, and even me, incorporate now the run game into the air raid with also the spacing that you have within the air raid. It just makes it an offense that is hard to stop. And now people can't just say, hey, air raid quarterbacks can't win mm-hmm. the big thing. Because now if you look at everybody, like everybody has some semblance of air raid. Mm-hmm. Like mesh and quad cross and and four verts. And all this was a descendant of Bill Walsh and and um, and BYU. Um, um, the OOC at BYU, I'm blanking on his name right now, of them grabbing that offense, streamlining it to it's like all short word concepts, and now we able, you're able to play fast and communicate fast and now just get off the ground and get rolling. So, man, that was the beauty of the air raid, man. And, and honestly, I always tell people, like, for me, everything I've accomplished is this offense, man. This offense has got me to the heights of everything I've been able to accomplish in my professional, my personal career as an athlete and also now my coaching career. How how hold up? How he was able to call plays and run that offense as prolific as he did <laughs> without a damn headset on. So it's it's all it's the air raid is all based on like and I don't, I mean hell the, the signals are the same. Like if you look at some air raid teams, those are signals that hadn't changed since way back in the early nineties. Like like how this is star six. Like it is what it is. I mean Hal always told us I don't care what the signals are. They got to stop it. You know. So that's how he always taught us. Like at the end of the day, and I'm same way. Like. I don't care. I'll run a screen. Like, go block them. Like, come stop us. Be physical. Beat us to the point of attack. If you do, hey, chalk it up to you. Good job. But other than that, you have to stop it. And so, like, you know, most of the thing was just like, oh, that year, Hal didn't really need a headset because, remember, it went to how much repetition we had in the summer. Mm-hmm. So, Hal would just get us in a base play, but Martin would get us in a better play. Gotcha. And so, like, Hal was called something. He would just give a formation, or he would just give a formation and tell him, hey, check with me. And Martin would just be like, okay, I see this, I see this. Hey, let's run this. All right, they playing this on the back end. Let's run the ball. They playing this, they bring a pressure. All right, let's zero coverage. Hey, I already know. I'm going to give you this signal. Let me, let's do this. I mean, we had it like that to the point to Coach Mummy, he'll tell you he didn't really have to have it. And then also, people don't realize this, like, he kind of dialed back a lot of the play calling. His son and Coach Goff call a lot of that offense mm-hmm. those uh, that year okay. too. So, okay. like, man, just the, the simplicity and the repetition is what makes this offense go and why every, kids are so able to gravitate to it and pick it up like so fast, man. It's just it's that, it's just a way of life. And so that's why I've always liked it because I'm able to confine it and move it to shift it to whatever I want. Like this past year at Kentucky State, we didn't have the receivers that I needed. So, hey, we had to be a little bit more run heavy. Mm-hmm. But it still works with the splits and things like that, what we're trying to do. So I just mold it and all you do is now change a few tags and a few concepts and now you can mold it to whatever you want to be. Run heavy, pass heavy, balance. Uh, different personnel, different formations. Hell, you can make the air raid look like on the center. It's the same stuff. Everybody's running some form of semblance of the air raid. So um, that just lets you know, like, how 
how strong and how powerful this offense is. Right. So, like, what I wanted to ask you, I wanted to flip it. Like, yeah. so, so G asked, how mm-hmm. is it, you know, being a player in the offense? <laughs> I want to know, like, how is it when going to Kentucky State oh, and man. implementing it? Because they oh, play, because that's, traditionally, that's not what they, what they did. Uh, you know, they, you know, f- they still had a full, they still playing 10 personnel. You know, yeah, they were, they were triple option the offense you know before I got there. So, so army slash neighbor, hundred percent like so, true army slash neighbor. So, swing back and one receiver out there. So I, you know, <laughs> so what I want to know is like how hard how hard was it like to come in and change that culture to what you wanted it to be? Yeah, with to where to where you are now because you didn't have to you mm-hmm. players at, at first. You mm-hmm. know, and, you know you're getting in like like you said earlier, like just. Meshing the yeah. the players to the scheme. Mm-hmm. Well, the good thing about it was, uh, again, being able to be offensive coordinator, I kind of like, kind of fast forward, rewind. I like the journey that I took, like taking a D3, D3 job where I didn't make any money. Like I had the money I had from the NFL, but my first job I made literally two grand a year. I made $400 a month. Well, $200 a month, actually. They taxed it. <laughs> All right, so that was just getting into it. But D3 actually helped me because now I got a chance to run my own room. I was, uh, I got a chance to recruit my own area. Also got a chance to now immerse myself in the offense. And my coach, he actually, Matt, he needed a lot of help. I was the only other guy that knew air raid like that. So he challenged me with, hey, Felton, get in the box. And early on, he helped me, taught me how to call it. Like, hey, Felton, you call, I'm going to call one. Whatever you come out there, you tell me what we looking like and what you feel, you call the next one. And so now getting to that point, like now I had on-the-job training. We had JV. And people don't know you have JV in college. So I was able to call all the JV games. So. Damn, I training, knew that. Training. Yeah, D3. like a lot of D2, D3. Never D3. knew that. It's built off numbers. Like how you get the enrollment in school, how you make the money, you get more kids. So you have JV programs. They play all the yeah. prep schools, the uh, some JUCOs and yeah. things like that, uh, the D3s. And so calling those games and then Matt giving me more responsibility and then me being able to get my first OC job at Charleston Southern University. People don't know this. They were triple option. <laughs> so they were triple option. They were spread triple option. Same triple option that uh Georgia Tech was. Really no, not Georgia Tech actually. Uh, I'll go at Coastal. Uh, Chad Chadwell, the Coastal. Jimmy Chadwell. The, 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 the yeah. gun spread. Yeah. The gun triple option. So all uh the pistol back with the two uh uh-huh. split backs. Yeah, Liberty split, now. Yeah, Liberty now. Yep. So they ran that. So literally, that was my first on the job training of switching the whole offense from triple to spread. And so when I got there, I got in there, again, learned on the fly, so it was a good thing. Got there, tried to just teach straight air raid that first spring. Oh, it was bad. Like, they never, no personnel. They didn't even know how to line up in a set. Like, they first time ever getting four wide. Oh, line, got to understand how to pass pro. Yeah, my quarterback was literally, all he did was dive options. So now teaching him how to, ha- how to do a drop and how to process coverages and things like that, like, that was tough. But that spring, we got better and better that summer. We got better and better. And at Charleston, we've had the best record since I left there. I've had the best record. We led the conference and, and told the offense. Um, again, we didn't have the personnel. Um, we didn't have a receivers. I started a true freshman, three of them, at PWO at Charleston. They all now Power 5 or G5 player at other places right now. And so uh, Cam Brown caught 13 touchdowns for me. Like, we killed it. But that was the thing. Like, we l- learned, like, hey, we got, still got some run tendency guys. But all I do is now let's find the strength of those receivers and what they can do well, and we just placed them and kind of configured them, and then we taught them everything. And then so when we were able to do that, like that was that was clutch. So I had my first realm in doing that. Now, coming to Kentucky State, now HBCU, D2, resources a little bit different. You don't really have all the coaches that when I went to Charleston, I hired everybody I wanted. Mm-hmm. Here, I got there, I didn't have everybody I wanted. So now just trying to figure out, okay, hey, how can I get the best out of my guys with the lack of things that I don't have. Like, I can't go in there and say, hey, just because I know this or I want to run this, in reality, that's not real life. Like, got to need different aspects. Hey, I can't go coach everybody, so I got to find out what those guys do well and be able to understand, like, what they can process. And it was a learning curve. And until we got to the end, we simplified it a lot down. We were super young. But uh, now, you know, 
we got we got some kids there, and we had injury bugs and all that. But we found a, a, a niche of what we were good at. We were good in the run game. Wasn't the strong at receiver. I had one guy that I brought from McNeese. He's actually from Pine. Markel Cotton, gonna yep. be an animal this year. Yep. You know about Markel, right there out of close to Bogalusa, man. You know how they play ball up that way. <laughs> and uh, I sound like New Orleans when I said that Bogalusa. <laughs> you know how they say that Bogalusa. Uh-huh. And so uh, now just getting there, and now understanding like, hey, I had already knew like, hey, let's put it in in spurts. Let's see what our guys can process. Okay. Let's give them one or two quick games, all right? If they can do that, okay, now we'll add now maybe a tag to it. If they can't, hey, let's always ease back. Don't try to put the cart before the horse. Like, just, hey, be patient and just now work with what we, what we can do. And it still was a little bit of struggle because we were young. But uh, when we got towards the end of the year, things started clicking. We understood we got the run game, but then now injury bug hit us. And then at that point, at that level, depth is an issue. Mm-hmm. And so when you start getting to now those third-tier, fourth-tier kids, oof, it's kind of a little tough. So, yeah. Honestly, like, like, not un- like getting there and, and and like I've been like I was I was I coached people don't know that I took a break after I left Charleston and then I went to uh, I went to Slaughter taught high school ball high school is a little different like yeah you might get you know in high school culture you might have a few good coaches right, right. but everybody's not you know as strong you might have mm-hmm. a coach that's coming neighborhood that you know that hey he gonna make sure the kids do what you need them to do. Right. All right. He might not be as strong as X and O guy, skill drill drive, but he can at least do that. So now understanding that, hey, okay, I might not be able to hire guys that I know that can do those things, but just put them in the best position you can to be successful. And so that was the biggest thing, like understanding that help is important. And now Mm -hmm. with lack of help, understanding where you can place them so now they can be, they can excel in their role. It's no different than what you're doing a kid. Like trying to find places that, they can excel in their role. Whatever their role is, just find a place that way, hey, they can do this to the best of their ability. And that's just not only football, that's just life. Yeah, 100%. And people understand, like, for me, like, that was maybe the other thing that I give you side note, like, understanding how important, like, ball is, ball is ball, man. Like, we're from a state, well, this is what we get, us. I mean, this is how ball. we get it. Like, we ball here. But also, we're from a state that life is hard. Mm-hmm. And so, like, my whole thing, and you can ask my guys, like, Majority of my message is not about ball. It's about how we maneuver in life, how we move in life the right way, and understanding how pivotal that is to being able to get the best out of your players. Because if they're dealing with stuff off the field, they ain't no way they're going to give you 110% on the field. field. Uh, not not at all. So having to understand that that was the biggest, most important thing, because most of my time is just literally, come on in, son, what we got to talk about? Like, come on in, son, Let's what we got to talk about? Like, hey, how can help you? Like, that's the important thing. And just having that open door policy and building that relationship. And now my dad taught me that. Like my dad, I used to watch people stop my dad as a coach everywhere. I was young. I hated it. I'm like, dad, we trying to go. Like, right. Go <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and my dad was a principal at Scholarville. And I Ooh. realized that Scholarville is another animal. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, it's another animal. <laughs> boy, it's boy, another boy, animal. Ball is ball is basketball, football. And we were at a game and some all the uh, kids that my dad taught stopped and say, hey, what's the Huggins? We want to take you out to lunch. Da, 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 da. And my dad was like, okay. And I'm sitting at the table with them, and they telling him how much he did for them. And they also tell him, like, all the bad Mr. Huggins used to whoop us with that paddle. And he used to, like, <laughs> yeah. But he was letting them know, like, they let them know, like, how important he was to them. Like, they wouldn't be what they got if it wasn't for him, like, being where they feet are. And it didn't hit me at that time. I used to hate it. But, like, as I got older and I really see, like, when I'm talking to my kids and I'm explaining life to them and now they come back and tell me and they telling me, like, Coach, I really th- I'm keeping it real with me because I would have never been able to whatever I'm able to do if you never kept it real with me. And uh, that's all my dad did. And so, like, for me, that's why I always knew this is always what I wanted to do, like, just helping kids. Like, I, we from the most talent-rich state in the, in, the, in the world, I think, hands down. And I've coached and lived in a bunch of places, Florida, ton of ballers, Georgia, ballers, ballers. Like, I coached there. But for me, like, this is a state that we don't have everything. We don't get nothing. Um, We're living in a disadvantage where kids look like us every day. But at the end of the day, we have the most kids that come out and excel in their situations, and their situations are hell. Yeah. Yep. And uh, It's facts. And for me, man, just that's why I want to get in it. Like, if I can find a way to help a kid, not to just achieve what I did, like achieve what they want to achieve. And that could be anywhere, on the field or off the field. I feel like that's what it's about. And that's what I, I know what I was already brought here to do, man. Like I already knew my path, my journey. 
Like, it's just to be here to help these kids. Like, nobody helps them anymore. Nobody talks to them anymore. Um, they leave them to their phone. And, but they're untalkable, man. They're in the devices. Yeah, they the devices. They're in there. Yeah. Oh, and that device is so powerful. Like, man. Just think about it, man. Yeah, like, and we had, like, the best thing about us growing up is we didn't know what we didn't know. Right. <laughs> no, right. Well, we... Right, you know, and that was actually a good thing. Your mama tell you, like, boy, you're too young. You don't need to know about that. Like, yeah. you ain't grown yet. We had Lee Hall. We, yeah, Lee Hall. 100%. We had all that stuff. But now, like, these kids can get some of this stuff, and now it's good, bad, and differently. And so now it makes them hard to understand, like, choices. Mm -hmm. right. Like, and I always, right. one of the things I instill in our guys is choices. Like, you have the power to make any choice you want to make in life. Like, point blank, period. But whatever choice you make, we have to be good with the consequences, good, bad, and differently. As long as we're good with the consequences, whatever it is, you know you got me. I'm going to help you. We're going to learn from it. We're going to grow from it, and we're going to continue moving on. But a lot of times, our kids don't understand the choices that they make not only affect us, but they affect the people around us. For real. And that's the most important. So, like, when I tell the kids I give them money, like, hey, when I take your money, if I take your scholarship, it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to really hurt you. It's going to hurt your mom. It's going to hurt your dad because now you put them in a position to now – but well, they already, school is high as I don't know what now. Mm -hmm. Yup. there, the portal is crazy. Like, the odds of getting in college now are so slim. I tell my kids all the time, like, it ain't hard for me to go find a kid. And I'm not trying to. I want you here. Right. But if I can't, like, it's kids in the DMs right now mm -hmm. just itching for an opportunity to play. And so, at the end of the day, we have to make good on our investments. Like, school, anything you do with your parents invest in time money financial support emotional physical all that spiritual like that is an investment no, we, for make good, we have to make good on the investment we want to return on the investment so our kids and i preach that to our guys understanding that the investment is key like we don't throw that down the trash we don't take 22 grand and just say hey i ain't feel like going to class right i'm gonna throw it away right no no nah, can't do nah. that I don't uh, think nobody got 22 grand where they can just, hey, oh, wait, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Not where so, I come from. Right, and, 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 not, and not from this state. Like, <laughs> if we already disempowered. I mean, we don't have anything. So for us, we have to make good on it, and we have to instill those values in our guys to understand that, hey, at the end of the day, you're going to make some mistakes. I'm not going to let those mistakes define you. Like, if we, the mistakes that we made, and if we would have had to get defined by some of them and not had a chance to grow, then we probably wouldn't be sitting in these seats. Facts. I know for a fact, for me, I wouldn't. Um, hell, people don't know this, Jay. Like, I was almost kicked out of Southeast. Never knew like, that. Like, Never knew that. Like, going Never into my All-American year, I was on academic suspension. Did not know it. Did not know it at all. My my, my parents know now because they can know. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk. <laughs> nah, but did not know this. Like, what nothing my head coach can do, what nothing nobody can do. Rusty Miller, the softball coach, talked to the talked to the, uh, the higher up administrators and got me back in school. I did not even know. I wasn't kicking it. I wasn't partying like that. I just didn't apply myself. I didn't understand how important time management and communication was in college and in life too. Like just okay, not trying to cram for tests. Don't wait till the last last minute. minute. Yeah, communicate to your teacher. Hey, just go and speak to him and saying, hey, how you doing or whatever. I go a long way. That long way. Way. Long and way. I used to speak to him. The only one I spoke to. And he seen me on the steps uh, outside of, uh, what was that? Uh, D-Vic. D-Vic. Not D-Vic. Not D-Vic. The uh, Kinesiology building. It was uh, the Kinesiology building. Kinesiology building. No doubt. Getting on the steps. And he's like, oh, what's wrong? I was like, man, I just got this letter. <laughs> they put me out for a year. It's going to some all American year. He said, what you did? I said, ah, man, I was on probation. Didn't know they on suspension. I had to sit out for a year. He said, give me an hour. I'm going to go do what I do. He came back, talked to him, said, hey, look here. I'm going to teach Felton how to do time management, study skills. Fellow will not get a C. I couldn't get a C or below. He will have the best GPA ever. I'm going to make sure I mentor him, make sure he get these things done. Wow. That semester right there, I had a 3.5. I never had anything low before that. And wow. him just understanding, hey, fellow, when you go in class, sit in the front. All right? Speak to him when you leave. Speak to him when you after you leave. When you get there, speak to him when you leave. Um, Make up, drum up a little conversation. Just understanding those things. All right? Now, don't wait to the last minute to study. Like, these are just simple skills that, you know, in high school, we probably didn't mm -hmm. have to do. We probably didn't have to do that. No, we didn't have to do that. And so understanding those things, I tell kids, like, all the time, like, currency had a song, ain't nothing changed but the address. Like, I always tell them, like, hey, guys, like, I if I hadn't been through it, I done seen it, I, my friends had been through it, I will literally watch a bunch of people go through it. So ain't nothing really changed but the address on how y'all do things. It's just a different way how they do it. But we've been through it. I'm not telling you not to go through it, but I'm telling you, hey, if you take this path, these are the outcomes that can happen. 
All right, now, right. you evaluate them how you want. I'm never going to make that choice for you. Right. But as long as we go with the consequence, we talked about it and we figured it out, hey, it's your choice to make. Whatever choice you make, I support you. Your journey to being a head coach is, is kind of a little unconventional. I got a lot of friends in the, in the <laughs> that's coaching college football, bro, that have <laughs> aspirations to be a head coach. Oh, it's tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, when did you know that you was ready to be a head coach? And just talk about some of the trials and tribulations that you've gone through mm-hmm. since you became a head coach at Kentucky State. Because we all know, man, you know, you go back and look at Nick Saban, whoever. Yeah. Everybody went through some type of adversity, some type of obstacles, oh, no doubt. you know, when they became a head coach. So for me, man, I knew I always wanted to be a head coach. I Well, first and foremost, I always set goals. Like, I always tell kids, like, ain't nothing you going to do in life. Like, we all, we've set goals. Like, yeah. We already got, like, things like, okay, short term, long term. So my goals were, okay, hey, get into coaching, learn the first year, be a receiving coach, good as I can be, and just learn, be a sponge. That was my goal. The next goal, within two to three years, I want to be an offensive coordinator. Like, I knew and in our profession, like, ain't too many OCs that look like this. No, right not at all. Facts. Like, it's hard. It's awesome. it, and they already think that we can only literally, we're not the guys that can kind of run an offense. So I'm like, okay. I'm Maybe that's a recruiter. Yeah, we a recruiter. Uh, we the guys that keep the kids in line. Like, yep. And so uh, it's pr- crazy. I mean, this, this is what it is. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to want to be OC. So Matt, again, yeah, that's my bro, man. Love him to death. Matt kept giving me responsibility. Hey, Felton, you're going to be the passing game coordinator. All right? I'm going to make you OC and title with me. And then my head coach, who well, my head coach at the time, who's now my DC at Kentucky State, he got the head job at LaGrange College. Gave me my first opportunity to be an OC. And so I was like, cool. And then I was like, okay, my next goal was I want to be OC at a, another level. D1, I always knew I didn't want to do big time ball. A lot of politics, a lot of stuff with that. I just knew where I wanted to be. So got that one. Okay, next one was like, okay, after I kind of got through that, no, like, like being OC, understood that. I was like, okay, my next goal is I want to be a head coach. I don't even care what level it is. Like for me, coaching, instilling leadership qualities, just in teaching young men how to be men, which I think in this profession has been lost a little bit. Not lost a little bit. Let me just be honest. It's been lost a lot. Mm-hmm. Right? I knew that's what I wanted to do. Like, I didn't care what level it was. Like, for me, it's just, hey, if you're trying to affect change, it don't matter where. It don't, don't have where. to be Power 5. It can be Pop Warner. Like, I wanted to be a head coach, whatever. It was high school, whatever level college it was, except the bigger time, because I wanted to affect change. And so, just going through that journey, but also now just, trying to understand and making connections. Like, I took a path that was kind of different. Like, same thing like I was in, uh, playing ball. Like, I just always bent was what my feet were. Um, I always just was student of the game, made certain connections, and then just honestly my faith. Like, man, at Charles and Southern, I like to tell people this. Like, our motto, and I've actually kind of took that motto from our Coach Archie Denson. Again, gave my first OC job. Shout out to him. His whole program motto was Faith Family Football. All right, and then I just tagged fun onto it. And a lot of football, honestly, everybody does the same thing. It's just how you incorporate it. Mm-hmm, and right. so for me, like, he used to say, like, faith in this process of us at CSU, which is now at KSU for us, is not seeing this process of what it is right now, but for seeing it for what it can be. So I always, like, tell people, like, that wall right there is solid. Like, I don't know what's on the other side of that wall. But at the end of the day, I understand that with my journey and the faith and the, and the way that we do things, how we do things, and why we do things, that I'll get to the other side. And I have my faith is strong. Like, I'm not understanding. Like, I know we don't have the things that we don't have. Like, at the end of the day, they don't guarantee you nothing. Like, all right. thing they guarantee you is you don't have nice stuff. Like, it doesn't guarantee you're going to be successful. It doesn't guarantee you're going to be a championship program. It yep. doesn't guarantee that you're going to go to the NFL. It's just guarantee that you don't have it or you do have it. So, for us, what are we going to do, our intentionality, to do those things to get to where we got to go? And our faith has to be strong because everything's always not going to align. Right. All right. And so, for me, just understanding my faith and understanding, for me, how important that was and just honestly just – just getting up every day and just walking my path, man. Like, not chasing what everybody else is chasing. Like, I'm seeing buddies coaching big time. And I probably could have done those things, too. Like, I, I saved up enough money in the NFL where I could have probably went and volunteer at a place. But I just was like, man, I want to just – I've always took the hard path. Like, and not really the hard path. I just always took the path for me. Your right. Journey, and, right. And it was just my journey. And so, just, if it caused me to have to get a little work in the end, like, okay, let's do it. Like, it was, at the end of the day, it was just always about the kids. And so now getting to K-State, like now understanding, like now I'm in these shoes, like now I'm a head coach. Like sometimes I have to like pinch myself because I'm sitting there and I'm asking questions like, oh, snap, I'm in charge. Like, in charge. <laughs> I'm in charge. I ain't really got to ask nobody, but I right. still kind of lean on, lean on things that people have told me. Like 
talk to Doug all the time and, and just coaches and and and, and you just to make the decision. Don't mean you know yeah, everything. Don't mean I have know everything. Right. You never and stop course. learning. Yeah, you never stop learning. Like always have a sponge mentality. Like always continue to work your craft and your trade, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're trying to do. Like if you're not working your craft, you're not working your trade, then first of all, why are you doing it? And then two, you just kind of like beating yourself around the bush. Like just go with yourself, immerse yourself in it. And whatever happens, if happens. you fall, like it happens. Just get your mind back up and let's try it again, man. Like it's always going to, you're going to scuff your knee. Like we grew up like that, playing right. football in the street. Like you're going to scuff that knee. Your mama said, oh, put some water on it. Get back out there and start playing mm-hmm. again. Look, a rock side. Yeah. 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 Put a little dirt on it. Put a little dirt on it. Put, put a little water. Yeah. yeah. Spray the hose pipe on yeah. <laughs> And take, water take, take me through the moment, man, when you got the call that you was going to be the next head coach at Kentucky State. Oh, man, I kind of. All right, so this story here, man, is crazy. So when I got the I got the offer, I told him, I said, well, can I come see the campus? I called the AD. He was like, yeah, come on up. Um, So I came down there. I went and seen the campus and seen it, but I had not made a decision. Uh, So I'm on the plane, man. I, <laughs> I don't tell the story a lot. My players don't even really know the story. So I'm on the plane, and uh, I'm flying back. You know you're on the plane. People don't like kind of like you kind of like either you like talking to people or you right. like sleeping right. or you don't. So I like sleeping. So <laughs> yeah, I hit the plane, me. I'm knocked out. I woke up halfway through the flight. It was like 30 minutes at the end of it. And this lady was sitting next to me. And so she tapped me. And she's like, excuse me, do I know you? And I was just like, nah. And I was about to just like turn and go back to sleep. But I didn't. And she was like, uh, she said, well, she said, question. She said, I was just praying. And uh, she says, I swear I know you, but I was just praying. I was talking to God, and he told me that he told me that you're gonna live here somewhere. I was like, okay, okay. it's like, <laughs> all right. And so I'm listening, and she said, well, I'm praying and I'm talking to him, and she tell me, she said, God just told me that you're gonna be a leader of men somewhere in this area. Like, no lie, I promise you, this is not a lie. Like, you're gonna crazy. be a leader of men in, in this area somewhere. And I got like my mouth, my jaw open wide. And again, that goes in my faith. And I'm just sitting there like, wow. I was like, well, <laughs> and I smell, I laugh just like that. I say, honestly, I just got offered a job at Kentucky State University. And I was just coming up here to see the place and trying to see if I'm going to decide if I'm going to take it. She said, oh, wow. And so the lady sitting next to her was her friend. And she was just like, she said, oh, she said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Louisiana. I'm from Zachary, but I live in Lake Charles now. And she said, well, I'm actually, I used to live in Lake Charles for Hurricane, what was the hurricane a couple years ago? Laura. Ida. Laura. Laura. That was Laura the, the Lake Charles. Lake Charles. Laura, 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 Laura. So yeah. she was down there volunteering for Laurel. Mm-hmm. And I was like, she said, I live, she said, I live literally around the corner where I lived at in, in Lake Charles. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and so, Full I'm circle. There, and so she's sitting there like, she was like, wow. And so she was like, yeah, she said, I promise she said, if you, you know, whatever you do, like, that's what God just told me to put on my heart to tell you. And she said, can I pray for you? I said, sure. So we prayed, but we landed. And uh, I got, I'm driving back because I flew in from New Orleans. And uh, No, I flew from Lake Charles. I'm driving back home, and I'm just sitting there, and I, I waited a moment. That would have been on my mind all night. Yeah, yeah, and I waited a moment, and I just knew, like, at that point in time, like, I mean, I wasn't always the most spiritual person, but I've always had a close relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I just knew at that point in time, like, Kentucky State was a place for me. God really don't, God don't make mistakes. Don't make mistakes. He puts you where he wants you to be. Again, being a head coach, you can ask for it, but you don't ask for you don't give a really got an opinion of where you can go, what it's gonna be like, what are you gonna have, what are you not not gonna have. At the end of the day, he places you places where he wants you to be, and it's for a reason. Um, it might be a great situation, it might not be the best situation, but at the end of the day, he puts you there because he felt like you got the shoulders that you can kind of overcome whatever you obstacle that you're going through. And so I knew at that time, man, like that was a place for me and and whatever it was, and I was just so enamored with the kids there that They've been there so long, and they will always just grind it out. And Kentucky State always had a really good football program, mm-hmm. football teams. And so I just knew at that point in time that was a place for me, and I knew that's where I wanted to go. And uh, just being where your feet are, man. It's that's dope, bro. Blessed. That's nah, dope. So. Let me ask you this. <laughs> now, you know it firsthand. I know it firsthand. The state of black college football. Oh, yeah. Uh, funding. Yeah. Um, exposure. Mm-hmm. Uh, resources. You yeah. name it. All, all of the at a deficit. Now with NIL, mm-hmm. now with transfer portal, mm-hmm. um, you used it used to be a time where your back black college football, 
you got the people that wanted to be there. Like this is oh, first. Man. This is this is first we charge. Just this is talking about yeah. This like, all this, the cats back then. This ain't no fallback option. This is this is this is where I want to be at <laughs> now. Black college football has the opportunity to get the bounce backs. You get mm-hmm. your, you know, the power five kids that that overlooked you. You're like, no, it's not working out for me. Let me be around my own. And, you know, Flores, how does it work being a head guy now, mm-hmm. building a program in this day and age of college football while also giving, like, respecting the roots of, like, you know, for the high school, where yeah. you come from and all that stuff and trying to, like, balance out both of that. Nah, that's a great question, man. It's just kind of first and foremost, like, understanding what path you're trying to take. Like, are you going to build through the portal? Are you going to build through high school ranks? Um, understanding your needs and also understanding that's honestly just just a fact like most hbcus right now currently present aren't set up to be able to give the kids everything that they need that a pwi is able to give them and honestly just side note like most pwis they have their issues too right like, people don't realize this like you'll be surprised yeah yep. like a lot of them don't have it it's just ours is more magnified just because it's more hbcu um now i do think that we're at a turning point to where if we can get proper things in order, get proper resources, get also resources that are owed to us by, like, for us, we're land-grant school. But we're underfunded for my land-grant. I mean, who? I was a ton of million. I don't even know the exact amount. All on 250. Yeah. All on 250. I think we're somewhere close to 100 million. Like, we're land-grant school. And that was a, a Southern's a land-grant school. FAMU is one. All these schools are underfunded tremendously. And this is just money from the state that's supposed to come to them that they don't have. And so, like, right there, like, understanding that we have to, like, it's a process. Like, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, we have to understand that whenever we get things that we just have to do right by the kids. Like, set things up. Hey, I know we don't have all of, we don't have all the nice buildings, but, okay, let's build them step by step. Um, at some point, we need to build, like, something that's solid because, as of right now, I would say this. Have y'all ever read this book called The $40 Million Slave? No, no, I haven't read it. So it's awesome read. Uh, uh, T.R. Roden, I forgot his last name. Long story short, this book is about literally uh, how, just take minutes going back to the Negro Leagues, how blacks at the time had a chance to literally have a monopoly over everything, like within sports. But also from the time, you know, at the time, segregation was, was really, really strong at the time. Mm-hmm. And we just wanted to kind of more assimilate. And it's for whatever reasons it was, were. All right. But. If we had the foresight at the time in this book, what they're reading, it's all based on true events, that we would be the monopoly. Like when the swag kind of when Eddie Robb was there and all those guys that right. we had all the talent, like the talent came there. Doug Williams, Shaq Harris, um, Too Tall Jones, like all those Jerry guys. Jerry Rice. Like we, Jerry Rice, like we had it. The Negro Leagues had it, mm-hmm. but we also kind of wanted to assimilate. And so we lost the power into our game. And so now we have a reckoning right now. Like HBCUs are highly lighting now like the spotlight is on us we have to just try to be intentional about hey one of my models our president like to always say is do no harm to the kids i love it because honestly this is what higher it is it's literally like hey yeah we teach them sports but also let's put them in the best uh position to succeed like our kids too like you know our kids whether they're black or white or whatever but definitely our, our minority kids and so when we have those things we have those resources making sure that we structure them in the right places to again do no harm to the the kids, but also building these leaders to now not only go back and affect stuff on their campuses and within their communities, but also back in their communities. And that's what it's about, like trying to get kids to be able to go back into their communities and instill things that they learn to hopefully better serve their communities. And now we're building the pipeline of now leaders and business owners and and things like that. Like I right. call our guys, like academics is key. I don't play about that. Like that's one thing I don't play because football has an expiration date. That'd be the first thing you, you ask me. Gee. Gee. What is GPA? I, I got to ask him. <laughs> like, kids don't, kids don't know this. Like, man, I uh, I first got to KSU, and we had 65 kids on the team. And first spring got there, and I got there late. And grades were horrendous. Like, they were bad. Got midterms, and I was like, I had over 30-some kids that weren't doing well. And I'm sitting there like, man. And I'm talking to coaches like, hug, this is your first spring. Like, it's important. Like, you got to get your culture. I'm like, but I'm saying like, Man, I'm literally serving our kids a disservice if I put them out there on that field and they ain't got nothing to fall back on whenever they blow their knee out or whenever they dump a ball. And so I cancel spring, like literally. 
I told him, like, hey, the kids that got the grades, I'm sorry, but we just going to work out and we're going to continue training. And it might hurt us, but we have to understand how important it is. It's about family. Forget about me, I love you, being other centered in the things that what we do, not only for us, within our communities, within our team, we're holding that stuff translating to the world. That's why my energy is always high. That was a bold decision. Yeah, and so I canceled it. And so I told the other kids, I made them call. I called each and every last one of their parents one by one and told them why they on suspension, what's the reason they on suspension, what are the things we're going to do to get them off suspension. And if they do right, I don't have a problem with putting them back on the team or whenever they show me they can handle college coursework, I'll bring them back. And uh, that spring, they all did. Like, I don't, I think I only had two kids that didn't. Every kid we had, we ended up finishing with over three, though, a two point. I had over 33 kids with a 3.0, two with wow. a 4.0, and we finished with a 2.91 GPA. And we were at like a 201, a 21 something. And so, just, just literally, I'm like, man, I, I can't not continue to just, hey, put the ball first. Like, cause I'm doing them a disservice. Like, the ball gonna be there. Like, that's, we played it all our life, man. We know how to do that. And we gonna, I promise you, I'm the most competitive human being on planet Earth. But for me, like, I cannot sit here and say that you come in here and I'm just going to always be about ball and not also give you something that's going to help you, not only help you, you, but your family and stuff that's going to help you within the future. Like, I'll be, I wouldn't be who I said I am. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be a piece of crap. Like, nah, let's give me some things that's going to hopefully help instill you for where you go whenever you grow in life and whatever you want to do. That's what it's always about for me. No, man. but here's the question I have for a lot of these kids today. I don't know, as we talk to kids, no, transfer portal has always existed. <laughs> it's always been there, right? It actually has. But the thing is, nobody's committing to stay with one program no more. I don't think the majority of kids now, you think about the biggest bulk of population of college sports, no one's staying at from a freshman oh. to senior or time to yeah. go pro. Yeah. What is the message to a lot of you as a coach to some of the kids, to get, not just getting to buy into the culture, but getting into to commit to yeah. finish? Because yeah. not everybody's finishing at the same place they started. Yeah. I, I, and, I, and I think the kids are hustling backwards like that. Like, so I, I, it's a podcast that I like. I probably know him like Bomani Jones. Like, I listen to him yeah. all the time. Love mm-hmm. Bomani. Bomani, I was just like, smart cat, smart brother. Smart stuff. dude. And one of the things he always say is like, kids ain't understanding. Like, one thing like, what helped us, like, staying in Southeastern, like, if I actually ever needed something, a help, I stayed at that place for three, four years, and now those people know me. So if, just say I did need a job. I can go back and reach out to the alumni base because I've been there for years. These kids nowadays, because they move around, like you build no relationship, you build no camaraderie, mm-hmm. you build no history. You actually build act, actually no footprint because you here, there, Correct. you're going tomorrow. So like, that is like, it's tough. And, and I think one of the things is like, I understand like we were raised in a certain type of way. and Before Google. Before you, Google. You said that, before yeah, Google. Yeah, before Google. And some of the things like, Maybe it was a little hard, but I would understand it. But also, I think that our kids, honestly, just, they don't like to go through nothing anymore. Like, if they can't get it the first time, like, they just, they kind of check out. And I'm just like, hey, at some point, like, man, Boosie said it right. Like, you got to bubble for your, I mean, you got to struggle for your hustle. Like, you yep. got to hustle. Like, you got to hustle before you ball. Like, and so, like, our kids just taking them through some things. Hey, it's not going to kill you. It's only going to make you better. Even if you fail, like, don't be afraid of failure. Yeah. Like, don't be right. afraid to fail. Like, some of the most failure, like, some of the people that failed a lot, some of the most successful people out there. Just think about the lady that wrote, um, uh, what's the, I'm uh, not Wizard of Oz, the, um, J.K. Oaks Owen, what's the, um, ah, I'm blanking on the woman's name. That do, uh, I'm blanking on the name. But anyway, uh, J.R. Tolkien, whatever that lady's name is. But anyway, she was, like, she was poor, living, and then she did Harry Potter. Harry Potter, Harry Potter books. Harry Potter books. J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling, yeah. And so, like, she failed a lot in life to get to those books. And so, like, sometimes, man, we just don't understand how important that stuff is. And the portal is an animal, man. But I just think the kids aren't getting the best advice. And I always tell kids, like, if you want to leave, it's okay. Like, sometime your first place, I transfer, so I understand it. It might not be the best place for you. But understand, okay, first, what's your plan? Like, you got to have a plan. Like, we ain't just leaving just to leave because now you ain't set with me. What is your plan? Like, if you have a plan, right. I don't have any problem about helping you, supporting you, whatever. But if you just blame you transferring on a whim or emotionally, like, that's not real life. Like, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not logical. Like, let's figure out why we doing it. What are the things that we're going to change in our next destination and how we will improve. So now we ain't having to leave again. We ain't out there steady searching for a greener pasture that's, Honestly, it probably was there, but you just didn't want to kind of go through nothing to get to it. Right. 
I just think that a lot of these kids is just in today's market. And I'm saying it wasn't us either. Mm-hmm. But I just, they, yeah. they, they think so much of now and they like the information on history. Yes. They like that. Okay. When they watch like the NFL draft, they think everybody well, they don't watch makes it. it. Don't you watch it? <laughs> but 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 it's, it's it's like they think everybody rode to becoming a pro, you know, professional player. It's just mm-hmm. being the best they can be about being the top echelon player. It's no like, doubt. That's not how it all works. Nah. Some of the best players we've seen came from smaller schools, yes. worked their way through things, yeah. got on the field, yep. probably started on special teams, not as a full five year, you know, yeah. starter. They've been had a ten year career, and I think that none of the kids today take the count into history mm-hmm. of how people get to where they are. They just they're so caught up into I can't even define any it's, words. It's the success. Yeah. It's and it's play. like it's also what they see. Yeah. Because they they see like, hey, my guy over at Georgia Tech balling and kicking it and partying. Okay, I need to get that too. Like there's no understanding that hey, he probably put a little work in right. to get to that point. Like it just didn't happen. Like if you notice now, like most kids are take them a while to kind of flourish because they don't really train like basics and fundamentals. Like right now, I teach our guys basics because I don't really even think they know it. Like when they come in, I assume they know nothing. Right. Like, right. Like you have, yeah. You, call you, you assume they know nothing, nothing. because they probably don't. Nothing. They just seen what they seen on TikTok. A 10, 15 second, second video. Clip. Right. Yeah. And thinking, okay, hey, I'm going to emulate that. And for some of that stuff, it is true you can, but for the most part, like skill set is skill set. Like understanding, like, like I didn't know how to run. I had to learn how to run. I had to run track. Me, Jacoby Jones, and all those yeah. guys at Southeastern. Like, that's why I was able to run a 4-4. Like, if I don't do that, like, I probably don't. And I probably don't play ball because I had to go and, okay, take this step to get to this step. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Understanding, like, I don't get there until I start here first. Got to start at the bottom. But see, I, I take it into one thing that um since I've met G, um one of the things that, that there's two things that he said that I just – I revolutionized it in my culture. One, parents are the biggest dream, mm. the dream killers. <laughs> That's my fact. I say that at least three, four times a month. And, and the, the second thing. Mom and dad. <laughs> the second thing is you only as good as your situation. So mm-hmm. if the person that you spend the most time with outside of me is your biggest dream killer. Mm-hmm. That means your situation is already on the wrong side of the seesaw. Exactly. So when you with me, I got to fix your situation and I got to be some type of roadblock in between that. That I got to be the reality into it for your dream. Before. All within a two and a half yeah. period. Two and a half hour period. Yeah. Man. All within a two and a half hour period. 20 hours a week. 20 hours a week. And out of this 20 hours, a game got to be played. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, you know, and so, it'll hit you later at night too. <laughs> like, go ahead. So, so, but it's like, it's, it's, it's navigate because. And you've been coaching longer. Than, you're like you're two years older than, than, than all of us. So, so like we've all played the game. Mm-hmm. The game from when we played to now is light years different. Mm-hmm. The these kids don't know the game. These kids don't understand. Like I could, I could tell my kid right now. Hey, you got you, your safety shade. The safety is shading right now. <laughs> You know, say he he's he, you know he's shading right now. So you are gonna have a whole player right now. So what 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 a ball gonna go? We 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 just call it double post. Mm-hmm. So it's gonna go to the first window, the second window. What window? <laughs> well, you think know, about that. You're bad. You're bad all over. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm so think about that. When you were young and you was with your parents or whoever your older brother, whoever they watch sports. All right. If you wanted to watch something else, you couldn't. You had to watch what? Mm-hmm. You had so to you had to watch. You had to watch whatever sports that was on: baseball, football, basketball, like. We probably, like, football or basketball or whatever those other sports, probably one of your main sports, but you at least had a general idea, okay, hey, if I play basketball, cut out the baseline. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, cut off the dominant hand. Right. You, you know, also, understanding defense. You also three. had a male yeah. that was sitting there like, he was, that, 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 he you. was telling you, hey, man, they see what he do that? They than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yo. Like, I was just saying, like, now most cats don't know ball, yeah. but, like, that guy – he was probably real good. Like, he right. understand at least the base fundamentals. And it's a ball. Oh, just think about when you go to your high school. Who always opened up the gym? The janitor. The janitor. Of the coast. And he was probably always had the best shot. We had one named Wayne Dell. Could shoot the lights out of it. Wayne Dell would sit there and come, we'd come at night, and he would shoot us, shoot us to death. But also, teach, hey, why you get that ball at the baseline? Like, hey, just put your foot on the baseline. You got out of bounds. That's your teammate. You know, just understanding, like, those things right there that those kids nowadays, 
We ain't sitting in the room without, well, they not sitting in the room with their parents. Mm-hmm. All, everybody in their phone, everybody looking. So now that added knowledge of, hey, we immersed ourselves in sports. Like, it didn't matter what the sport was. Like, right. we was in there. So you remember Lanes and El Pedro. Yeah. First of all, side note, to me, Linares was the coldest cat to come out of New Orleans. Hands down. I, like, see, I know a lot of cats. I saw Jackie. And that's during the time okay. I know. I see Sight. Right. That's, and that's and on to Darryl. Like, he definitely up there. Yeah. He definitely up there. Like, I see, I'm thinking about cats in New Orleans now. Like, I, I say, say, my history second. of the game. So I, see, I, 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 I say second you to, 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 to Daryl. To Daryl, yeah. And We just had the conversation earlier. Like, Daryl from OB Walker was probably, well, just from, I would say this. Daryl was probably the coldest because he fit the size, height, Right. Prototype. Yeah, prototype. Yeah. 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 Tarot 6'2", mm-hmm. 195, 200. Like, <laughs> flying. Could fly, fold, fold. Could jump. Could jump. Could play they gonna get off. They could run it back. They're going to take band. <laughs> now, Linares was, okay, 5'10", but if okay, that, if that <laughs> could play quarterback, could play receiver, could play running back, corner, play corner. DB, play corner. Special, uh, return specialist. Looking in the paper one day, you know, back in the day, we got yeah, the paper. Time, time, time to be <laughs> Are the, the bad rules of the advocate? Yeah. On Saturday, L page, six yeah. touchdowns and three picks. <laughs> like, and we looking like uh, we had the crib in the morning, like, damn, L page. Like, yeah. Hell, man. I, so, and I know he coaches at Wisconsin. I, I, I talked to him when I was at Magnese one day. I said, Coach, he called me. I'm Coach L. I said, Coach, you ain't got to tell me who you are. Coach, <laughs> I know who you are. Man. Like, literally, like, you was. Who we all talked about, Fact. like back in the game, like fast, explosive, then went to Tulane, played, yeah. and like killed him. I'm like, they could play receiver too. Like, y'all just right. didn't realize y'all ain't know that. Right. <laughs> the kids, they don't know that. Right. So they don't, and they don't know their history, they don't though. Know it's history. Nah, it's, it's that's what we knew. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was, it's his own, like, G was mentoring one of his players. Yeah. Like, do you know who that is? They probably didn't. And he, nah, he didn't. didn't. He probably didn't. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. That's the part oh, that he played. That'd be the funny thing. Like, you tell him, okay. All right, they might know Randy Moss, but if you tell them like a side person, they will not. Uh, I was say, Vince was like, okay, uh, I used to always say Anquan Bolden. When I was in the league, Tyke Tober, I received a coach in Buffalo, he coached Anquan Bolden. Like, hands down, Anquan was probably the most all around receiver that you could probably watch. Like, literally. And when the fastest. And when the fastest. Fast. 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 don't realize this. Anquan was another, was a quarterback. Five yep. star, yep. ran yep. four, yep. eight. Yep. yep. Coming in the 40. Yep. Anquan was physical. He ran routes the same. He would knock you on your ass, like all those things. Tell a kid about that, coach. We don't know who Anquan Bolden is. It's and it's like, so embarrassing. Send him a clip. No, and it makes you. And, and, and then they go say some dumb. Like they'll go say a play that they watched today. You be like, who? Well, they he, better than he, who? He Mawson, coach. He ain't doing this. Yeah, he ain't, he ain't Odell. <laughs> yeah, he ain't doing it. You be like, come on. Now. If it ain't a highlight, it ain't good. Nah, it ain't. It ain't. Like y'all don't know the game. They bro. don't know the game. And I, that's the part that's tough. I think I think an uh, important aspect, man, with, with this generation, and uh I coach a middle school basketball team, and what I what I implemented this season with them was certain practices they'll show up, we wouldn't even practice. They'll think about the practice, we wouldn't even practice. And I'll bring them in the cafeteria and uh we got a TV and I'll put on a movie. And I got a bucket. Everybody put their phones in the bucket. Yeah. Everybody put their phones in the bucket. And uh, the last time I did it, we watched uh, Year of the Bull. Oh, that's a good one. That's a real good one. Year of the Bull. That's old school, too. And <laughs> when I tell you that galvanized us as a group. And how did it do that? Like, I'm always. Because. Like, because. How the, well, how the you, cake you, was made. Well, you know how, how, the, how, the, how the whole movie went when, yes. you know, it was some hard coaching. Right. Hard coaching. They talking to you stupid. One one of the you know in one of the clips he fighting he fought the uh, yeah. player the whole the whole saying back in the day and I know y'all had to say it in New Orleans hey meet me in the shower yeah, yeah. in the shower yeah. meet me in the shower like okay and it did matter coach or player yeah right meet him in the shower like five ten minutes you nobody know hair it out real quick right and it's over with we back we good <laughs> right right uh what, what the guy name was Torrance Small yes yeah. yeah so and when the movie went off all of them was just like talking about. Damn, boy, I don't know what I'd have did if Coach G would have did me that, blah, blah, blah. And I was explaining to him, that's how we was coached back in the day. Yes. And my mama wasn't coming up to the school saying, what you, you did, did to my child? Nah, nah, nah. My mama, was, my mama was telling me, you must have did something for him to do that yeah. to you. And if you weren't playing it, it was the reason why. It was a reason like, why. Your mama was like, okay. Your daddy was like, okay, work harder. And yeah. if you work harder, 
I'm not about to, like, I'm not I'm about not to transfer you to another yeah. school. Nah, you don't quit nothing. Right. Th- like, th- and that was one thing. You can't quit. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing with the kids today. It just, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, and I'm not saying that Porto is a quitting nah, man's talent. For some reason it was. Like, it was granted. It was warranted for Yo. some of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just, yeah. now it's just at a point where the kids now, when it, like, like G was alluded to, that guy and I to put the kids together and getting kids to bond and getting kids to understand that, Look, your phone devices don't matter right now. We, this is a team yes. building exercise. Yes. And it's like, it's like everybody's caught in the matrix with these phones. Yeah. And mm-hmm. there's real, real life going on. And, yeah. and in real life, you got to deal with real things in real time. Oh, man. Yeah. They don't even understand how to yeah. do that. That's why I said most of the job is when you're talking to kids, if you're in any aspect, the more the majority of your job is not really coaching. It's, it's just trying to teach a yeah. kid, okay, yeah. like, teach what do you like communicate? To communicate. Yeah. Yeah. I got a kid that'll tell me, hey, coach, how am I supposed to go contact my teacher? Uh, email, email, right. like <laughs> email, email. Right. like uh, go speak to her. Like, right. I'm supposed to do that. What I'm supposed to say to a coach? Uh, introduce yourself. Right. Yeah. Say this. Say this. Say this. Like you said. Like yeah. none of those small things that they only know how to communicate on this, and none of this formal. Yeah, in, the matrix. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I like what you call it, the matrix. Matrix. Like, actually, what you yeah. Like, yeah. Like the matrix. Was talking about like like it's it's like a flip of what G did, but like when my players come up to me. Because we call it our, our defense, we call it the dark side. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So when they come up to me, man, Coach, man, got a question for you. I say, all right, man, what, what you got for me? You know, the dark side never let you down. That's 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 how that's how that's how that's how our conversations go. It, the players are vice versa with me. Man, I'm about, I'm about to DM this girl so to to see um if I could get her to go to prom with me. I say, why DM her? Go talk to her. Yeah, go talk to her. Man, I ain't about to get shamed in front of my face. I said, man, look here, let me tell you something, bro. <laughs> There's a guy a little story about a black book. You better build your black book up. <laughs> if that black, if 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 not the old roller if, 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 if one if one if one say no, they got about three or four that goes in. But like they're they're afraid of rejection, right? Mm-hmm. They yeah. they're afraid of confrontation. Yes, but they but they play the big bag whoop because yes. over here, I'm like I'm protected. Right, there's nothing I can. Do all this all day. Yeah, you, know yep. you know what I'm saying? And like I act like this never happened. Yeah. <laughs> and you and the chances of me meeting the person that I'm going back and forth with are slim to none. Uh-huh. Unless I'm unless in a small small town. But like the the thought of man, you've been going to school with this girl since pre-K. Mm-hmm. A simple, hey, when you go to dance with me, it's gonna kill you. She gonna say, it's two days she can say, yeah or no. Right. Get it over with. No, no the doubt. They are. And it's so funny you say that. So I had a alumni at KSU named Jabbar Godfrey. Like Jabbar, um, he's a motivational speaker for Nike. Um, he's done Michigan, Ohio State, all these big schools and brands. Like he does mental health motivational speaking. So I told Jabbar, like, I'm big on like, I want our guys. Yes, I play in the league. I can bring a lot of those guys around. But I'm also like, I like to show our guys, like people that made it successful outside of ball. No like, doubt. Hey, you graduate, look what he does. So look so right. We Javar was able to bring a bunch of people that went to K State, alumni that now flourishing outside of their role. Got an alumni that's working with the G League. I got an alumni that has a Fortune five hundred company. So Javar had an alumni that's actually a actor. And so he was up and he was going through this field we had before the Morehouse game, was just talking about, hey, like understanding like when you trying to make connections or just understanding life when you have an opportunity like we ain't finna go message nobody. Like, open your mouth and just go over there and speak. So he said, hey, who all want to be like an actor, a model? So one of my kids named Michael McGee at the time raised his hand. He said, okay, how many of you guys in this room is an actor, professional actor, acting in movies or acting in you know, certain things? And one alumni was like me. It's a guy, he's been in like, um, I forgot a couple of different movies or whatever. And he's also works with Old Spice. He was in the commercial ads. He said, that's me. He said, okay, what do you want to do? He said, oh, okay, I, you know, introduce me to him. He said, no, get your behind over there and go introduce yourself right now. Like, that's the moment. Like, what yeah. are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Like, seize the moment. Seize the opportunity. It'll mean more if you go and introduce yourself and now talk to that guy, that brother in person, than now you trying to formally, and now he still has to go about trying to figure out who you are, mm-hmm. if he even answer your message, when right now there's no such thing. The best impression is the first impression. Mm-hmm. Like, yes. go over there and do it. And like, that was powerful. And I was just like, wow. Like, that was important. Like, even for me, like, I learned the bar. Like, hey. Understanding, like, hey, it's okay to ask for help. Go over there sometime, introduce yourself to people. You never know how far that'll take you. You never know. Like, for us, we've done it a lot in the community trying to get out and do things. And now people come up to us just because, hey, they've seen us out and they've seen the good things that we do. And so they, hey, Coach Huggins, whatever you need, what do you need help with this? 
or hey, I got a kid for you that can fit, or hey, we donate you this. And so it's all about just giving back and giving forward, but also take seizing the moment and taking advantage of your opportunities. Like don't let an opportunity to pass you by. Like you never know who you're in the room with if you don't open your mouth. Yo, and talk. No, facts. Yeah. Well, one that's, of the one funny. of the thing, yeah, one of the things I'm so big on with this younger generation, and I'm always preaching it. And any kid that watching this podcast, they they gonna be like, man, Coach G ain't lying. I'm big on communication. Oh, got to be. Big on communication. I'm big on being able to hold a conversation. Yeah. I'm big on having your undivided attention when we're yeah. talking about something. And I think one of the biggest things is parents, we they, we got to do a better job of when our kids come home from school or we come home from work. Man, let's take the time to just put the phones down, sit at the table, have something to eat. Man, tell me what happened at school today. I don't care how small and insignificant you might <laughs> think it is. Let's 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 have dialogue. Yep. And I think that's what's missing at home. You know, I think a lot of parents they come at home, they on the phone or they in their phone and they they putting something to eat on the stove and then they go in their room and closing the door. Mm-hmm. And social media is raising gotcha, our generation. Gotcha. Yeah, generation. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with a kid. They don't even they can't they, they can't even look me in my eye. They can't they can't they don't even understand how to hold a conversation. They don't even know how to spell certain words. If I tell them like, look, go write this on a piece of paper oh, and <laughs> I'ma send it to this person for you. And I look at the paper and I'm like, bro, you don't know how to spell? Because the devices. Yeah. The devices, they are showing, they, you know, autocorrect. Autocorrect. Yep. And, and so I said all of the same, man, I just think that um, us being leader of men, mm-hmm. yeah. um, we got to keep on pushing the needle, man, on under, making kids understand the importance of communication. Because just like you said, you never know who you're in a room with. You know, you might be in a room with somebody that could get you a job or get you further ahead in your career, and you don't even understand how to go up to that person and hold a conversation and articulate yourself the right way to put yourself in a position to get further in your career. And so um, we teach that through the game of sports. Yep. Because, yeah. you know, sports, man, that's why I love sports so much, dog, because it, 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 it teaches you so many life skills, bro. Okay, if you don't communicate, man. you don't know the play. Oh, right. You don't get the defensive call. It you is don't cr- get the offensive call. It's crazy that you say that, G, because Fred, Fred can tell you, G can tell you, like, G asked me, like, every year, Man, hit. Who you got for me? I need him to play on my seven on seventeen. Man, <laughs> boom, boom. And one is the respect I have for for G, mm-hmm. but two is it's it's a teachable moment. And that was one day that um I've learned during coach never pass up a teachable moment. Oh, never. So when G was like, "Hey, hey, who you got for me, man? Or who up there?" Da-da. I give him their number. I say, "Look, this is this this is a guy. He runs the seven on seven league." For under armor. This is not a text message. This is not an email. <laughs> you call him, you introduce yourself, <laughs> and we'll we'll go from there. Mm-hmm. He has the final say so. Gee, how many calls you have got? Because they're afraid of that. But then they'll keep like when he comes around, man, oh it's G Sport. Man, I ain't know you know G. Man, don't think me. You see that you tell me what we say on the podcast. When we was live, you was telling me what we say live. Mm-hmm. So you know I know. Oh, yeah. You know you know like we like it's a we have a genuine relationship. You yeah. know that we're about about the kids. But the reason why I do that is if you can sit there and have a conversation with G. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's not asking you for money, right? Who's only trying to publicize you, you know, get yeah, you, get you exposure, just yeah, give yeah. you a different experience, just give you an what opportunity. You, what no, you gonna do is. when a coach huggers come sit down in your in your in your in your kitchen on your at your kitchen table, and Coach Huggers is stuck between and G, and they both the same. You know, say I got one scholarship, brother. Whoever gonna sell me the best is gonna win. And the, you the can't have guy. that conversation because <laughs> you check my highlight, check my huddle. Well, that's uh, that's I need, doctor. I, I want to know who you are. I want to know who you, you are. Yeah, but you can't, who you, are. you can't, like, I just, Coach Hank just gave you an opportunity to talk to somebody that don't want nothing for you. Hey, look, I trust him. He's not going to, he's, he's not going to send me no, right. he knows what I do. So he's going to protect my brand right. on, on, on that aspect. So he's not going to recommend nobody that's, that's, that's going to be bad for me. Right. But, right. He can't, Mr. Jeremiah, I'm such and such, player St. Helena, Coach Singleton told me to give you a call. 
let's talk. Yep. You kids don't do want to have uncomfortable conversations. So, 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 so like, so t- didn't pass up teacher moment. So like every year, every year since I was at AME, he's been he's been asking me asking me next week. And every year, I, I, that's what I've been doing. And to this day, he's yet to get a call. That's been like eight years. So, like, I I didn't realize how important these two bars y'all just said about the communication kids communicating until, so I took, after I left Charles and Southern, I taught a year in high school. So I went back. That's what I went to school for, a teacher. Mm-hmm. Like, being a coach is a teacher. Like, point blank, period. Oh, like, right. You teaching. Like, if you want to coach, you might as well teach because that's what you're doing. And so one of the biggest things I learned, that was right before COVID, when I was doing COVID, right after COVID, like understanding when you catch kids early and, and like talking to them and ask them like, this is how you kind of start kids to communicate. Like if you don't start them early, then they won't communicate. They'll feel shy. They'll feel socially and awkward. They'll feel uncomfortable. Like when I used to ask a kid how he was doing, like I used to tell him no. Like I really want to know how you're doing. Right. Like I want to I'm know. not just small talking. Yeah, I'm not small right. talking. You're like, no, tell me what's going on. I had this one kid, man, that, uh, I won't say his name, but no one used to talk to him when I was at Slaughter. And um, for me, I talked to anybody. Like, it didn't matter. Like, what's going on, big fella? That's right. always a term of endearment. I kind of it makes it open and inviting. I smile. And uh, at first, he kind of walked by me, just like, what's up? I said, man, come talk to him. It's not like you got something going on. What's going on? And then we just kind of small talk. And then the next day, he came back around. He's like, what's up, Coach Huggins? First time he had spoke. Like, literally, like, the two months I was there at first. And he kind of spoke to me, and then we talked a little bit more. And then the next time we talked, he opened up and told me what was going on in his household. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, tough household. And then mom and dad in and out the house. Uh, don't really have a father figure in there. Like, just rough. Rough. And he was just literally just opening up. And this was white kid. Like, he was just trying to find someone to open up to least vent about what he has going on. And that he could trust. That he can trust. Hopefully help him. And if it doesn't, at least he, now he knows he has an ally. And someone that, hey, they're not going to judge him for what's going on in his life yep. or what shortcomings that he may have. Yep. And hopefully that part right then, the kid ended up doing well. And 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 I just, just always took that with me. Like, hey, when I ask a kid how you doing, like, I really want to know, like, how you doing? Like, so now whenever the next person that you go talk to, you know how to have that conversation um, right. and not feel uncomfortable or not feel like your guard has to be up because they're going to use whatever they're about to say against you. And so that was always important to me, man. I had to be intentional about those things. How do we, as as young black men, because I, I still feel like we young. Oh, I'm about to, I always, I'm 41 years old. I'm about to make 40 in July. <laughs> I still feel like we young, bro. Uh, how do we do a better job of, you know, as leader of young people, mm-hmm. uh, understanding the dynamics that everybody home life not the best, mm-hmm. and yeah. how do we change the narrative of, you know, young, and and not just black kids, but all kind, all kids, white, Hispanic, it don't matter. Just changing the dynamic of their mindsets, bro. Yeah. Coming from poverty or coming from a alcoholic household or a abusive household or whatever the case may be, molestation, you name it. Yeah. I've heard it and seen it. Yeah, right. right. How do we change the the narrative in their in their mindset, bro? That um they don't have to be a product of the environment. And before you answer that, I want to add on. And prepare them for the next chapter of their life, whether it's athletics, uh, academic, or just life. You know, to, to like to marry all that together. Well, man, just I guess the first thing is just letting them know, like, hey, we still go through some of this stuff too. Mm-hmm. Like, w- just because we're adults, don't mean that we're not immune to. We have family members that still are in those environments. Life, life be life and Yeah, life, life be life Life, life. <laughs> life be life and man. Life, life. It don't stop. Like, I always tell people, like, that when it's gloomy outside, that's life waiting on you. Like, it's going to affect you. Like, I, my kids, like, Coach, you always, your energy always how you smile. I'm like, man, I understand that at the end of the day, life is short. And I understand that as long as the good Lord give me the opportunity to wake up, at the end of the day, I have no complaints. If I'm going to worry, I mean, if I'm, well, I pray if I'm going to worry. Mm-hmm. And so, like, for me, just first and foremost, just letting the kids know that you care. But also, when you let them know that you care, not being afraid to tell them and hold them accountable. Like, my dad always taught me, be firm, but be fair. Mm-hmm. Like, whenever you firm but be fair, like, the kid will give you the world because he'll always know you're never going to do things without the best intentions. Mm-hmm. Even at the point in time where they might feel it is, they'll think about it, and they'll come back and say, you know what, Coach, I understand it. I probably blah, 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 blah. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that, whatever. And just always let them know, like, hey, even though I'm telling you these things, like, doesn't mean that I probably hadn't been in this situation or not know someone else is doing that situation or probably still dealing with that situation. Some of the things that our kids talk about, like, hell, I've, I've done it. I'll probably still deal with it. 
And so understand it also, I've been through things like mental health and stuff that is very, very important nowadays. I don't like to weaponize it, but Mm -hmm. I do like to make sure and I let people know that I understand it. And it all is an issue. And it is something that we have to go through. I thought COVID, it affected all of us. I know Mm -hmm. it affected me. Just understanding that, that, man, like each and every day, man, like your environment of anything can throw you off kilter, could really affect you. And so it's just always just one. I, we had an interview the other day and a guy just told me to say, you always listen, learn and lead. Like when mm-hmm. you come in, you listen and then you learn what's going on. And then once you learn what's going on, then you lead. And so like just taking that bar and just like understanding, okay, Hey, before I even make my judgment, let me figure out what's going on with the kid. Like what is a girl or a young lady or a young man? And then now learning about, okay, what is about this situation that we must understand to try mm-hmm. to fix or whatever? And then understanding that we might not fix the situation, but at least we can put you in a position or put you around the right people to help you fix whatever you're going on. Fact. And then after that, now we find out how we're going to attack it and let them know that we're going to attack it together. Like, at the end of the day, I always tell my kids, like, don't lie to me. As um, long as you don't lie to me, I promise you, and I'm intentional about this, like, I, I don't like the mistreatment of kids. Like, in our profession right now, like the mistreatment of kids, and even as we was coming up, like it's very, very rampant right now. Right. And they don't understand a lot of things that reason a kid is not maybe responsive as to what they were when you watched them on film. It's probably the environment. Probably that, mm-hmm. I can tell you for a fact, I recruit East St. Louis, they'll tell you like, hey, from where they're from, they don't really trust my uh, Caucasians. Like they don't trust white folks. And that's an environment that some got coaches don't understand that when the kid come in and he's not receptive to what you're saying, it's probably why. Like, he's not why. used to seeing around. Yeah. He's not used seen. to that approach or someone like that telling him, hey, you need to do this or whatever, or I'm going to kick you off. Like, now we're not understanding. And so, like, as long as you firm, you let them know what's the reason is, but you're fair, and just tell them, like, hey, I always like to say at the end of the day, whatever, I, whatever we talked about, I'm not going to let you leave the building or let you leave my office for you got a clear understanding of why I said what I said Mm -hmm. and what was the reason why I said what I said and how can we fix it to now move forward to where we don't have that issue anymore. And understand, like, I get it. Sometimes it's it's good to say, excuse my language, I effed up, coach. Right. Like, okay, cool. That's great. We human. We We human. human. Now, (laughs) okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Yeah, what are we going to do to fix it? Like, one one of my players, Bobby Hayes, one of the, one of my best players on the team right now, I let Bobby talk to a lot of league cats. Every time he come in, like, Coach, I call him one of you practice playing league. Like, I let him talk to Robert Roy, another New Orleans legend, playing mm-hmm. a car. Yep. Rob talked to him about, and all of them kind of told him the same thing. Like, hey, what are you going to do different when adversity uh, hits? Like, how are you going to handle those things? Like, what are the things that you're going to do? Like, I let him talk to my one of my buddies, Spencer Johnson. Like, I just let them talk to guys. And that message for cats in the league, like, you ever talk to a cap in the league? Like, they'll tell you that message is all similar. Like, hey, be where your feet are. Like, at the end of the day, you got to go above and beyond the next guy to get to where you got to go. Like, we, it doesn't matter if you was a five-star or four-star. The expectations of you supposed to be this are tremendous. Like, because you're coming from a place to where a lot of people where you're from don't make it. Like, wherever you came from, a lot of people, you got stories that show that they weren't yet. So now just right. understanding, like, what is the process? What was the mindset that you guys did to get to these points? And just also letting our kids understand, like, Whatever you're going through, like, I'm going to be there with you. Like, I promise you, if I can't figure it out, I promise you I'm going to go find the things I can to help you guys succeed, man. That's what it's about for me. Like, I I really don't. I've done the things I want to do. Like, this is just what I love to do, man. Just if I can help a kid do the things they want to do, whether it's on the field and off the field, that's the only thing that matters to me. And uh, I'm like, I'm very intentional about that. Seeing them figure it out, boy, that's so gratifying. Oh, that's that's, that's the mm. best feeling. That's a, that's a, you can't watch that kid. Oh, you can't. Oh, no. Just watching them figure it out, watching them now understand, like, hey, like, I just remember that moment I thought I figured it out, like, oh, snap, this is what it was to be a college student. Take your behind, sit in the front, speak to the teacher, mm-hmm. even when you don't know stuff. Oh, I see you had a good game that game. Okay, come on here, let me help you. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Like, and they didn't have to, but they did it. Like, understanding those things. And understand, like, at the end of the day, enjoy the small wins because they also, where we're from and how we are, yep. they don't come a lot. A lot. And so when you get those small wins, just understanding that you get them. Um, don't be satisfied. 
you got to continue grinding because there's always someone out there that's trying to get to where you got to go. So, I got a two part question for you before we gotcha. get ready to close down. Gotcha. <laughs> man, I was watching the NFL Combine very closely <laughs> last weekend, man. And you watched a little bit too. These receivers, bro. Oh man, it's a there's a deep receiver draft. That's your position, man. That's your that's your <laughs> position, FT, man. Uh, uh, my first question is, man, what you know, if you was a team of need, which would and you needed a receiver, okay, who you going with at one and why? Oh. And my second question is, that's a tough one. With the way that the receiver position is being played now, versus when you was coming out and when you was at Southeastern, mm-hmm. um, how have you adapted to how the receiver position is played now? And, and you know, when it comes to teaching your kids and, and getting them to enhance their, their receiver skills. Whew, all right. So the draft, the receivers, man, the top four are like sick. Like, first of all, you got all of them. You got two that got height, size, wingspan. What you looking for? Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. You got Roma Dunze. Like, low key. Roma Dunze, a dog. Like, he cold blooded. Mm-hmm. Like, 6'3, two, almost 220. Mm-hmm. He ran low 4'4. Four, four. Uh, Got to catch Raiders out this world. Like, I know Marvin Harrison Jr. is that guy. Like, he's that deal. But, man, like, Roma Dunze, like, he's an animal. So, like, for me, it's it's still, it's still Marvin Harrison Jr. I like Malik, but I know Malik is kind of like that slot guy. But Malik got versatility, too. Like, mm-hmm. that's one thing I know Malik is going to excel in the league because you can move him wherever. Mm-hmm. Like, he can play outside. He can play inside. inside. Um, He's good in separation. Like, he's a he's a after-yak guy. Like, mm-hmm. you want that guy, like. Fresh LSU. legs, like LSU. yeah. But the sleeper guy that that I'm not gonna lie, I think he gonna be an animal. He from here, Brian Thomas, man. Let you, oh. Brian Thomas, and this cat was a straight basketball player. Again, yeah. that's knowing yeah. your history. Yeah. I wasn't even here in Louisiana at that time, but him, I'm always him, like him we were just having the conversation. Cook. We were just having this conversation about Jarvis Landry. Like yeah. I told you, like I knew Jarvis. I used to show cats when I was in Georgia. Like, hey, no, I was in league. Like, hey, this is. I played with it. I played against his brother, Gerard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gerard was at Southern. Like, look at this cat right here. Like, I used to show Josh Reed them all the time. Play that ring. Mm-hmm. Josh, like, this cat right here that your alma mater, like, he gonna be that dude. Like, you just know. Like, but Brian Thomas, like, just watch. A freak. Him. He a freak. He a freaking nature. Like, 6'4. He 210, 220. Mm-hmm. He ran 4'3. Jump out the gym. Like, a lot of stuff you're getting now in football is kind of matchup. Base. Like you're getting a lot of cover one because teams run the ball so well. Mm-hmm. It's RPO based. So now you're getting a lot of matchup on the outside. And that guy, that kid, man, like once he figures it out, because he he's super still raw. Uh, yeah. And you can tell, but like once he figured it out, and he had probably one of the best now, one of the best top receiver coaches in the nation, which is Cortez, mm-hmm. Coach Hankton, man, like kid gonna be an animal. Like I'm I'm excited to see now once like wherever he goes and how he fits and how he flourishes. Like I think he's a sleeper, but if I go, I'm like Marvin Harrison one, Roma Dunze two, Malik Neighbors three. But it's a, it's a it's a close three between all of them. Do you think uh, some of the NFL scouts and with with some of the media is saying when Keon Coleman ran that four six, do you are you putting that much emphasis on it? If no. you in the lead, no. Versus when you put the tape on, no. I love game speed. Like I watch cats. Like when I was in the league, like I would just say and. Even though Darius Abel Bay had a long career, but he ran 4-3, but wasn't the really – didn't catch the ball that well. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, we've always played – you've been in Dante the league. Stallworth. league yeah, Dante Stallworth. Dante Stallworth's guy. Right. Now, he figured it out towards the end, but a lot of those guys don't. Playing speed is key. Like, I just remember, you know, going into my third year when I was in the league and just, you know, now going against all the older guys. That was my third year I was on practice squad, and now the game finally slowing down. down. Man, like, understanding, like – you don't even have to, like, once you got to play, you knew what you had to do. You knew your adjustments. And now it's just now scanning the field. So now you can run and move at your own speed and your own pace. But to everybody else, it's, like, it's frenetic. But to you, it's, I always just call it, like, poetry in motion. Mm-hmm. And so now just the receivers nowadays, like, the kids not understanding, like, hey, like, wasted motion. Like, I think that's the only real thing that kids don't understand nowadays. I see you set up on that. Yes, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like the kids see, like, wasted motion. They got all this cross. It's all they, they watching like, Justin Jefferson. And yeah. watching it, but they're not understanding like after a while, like the clock process that Justin's having when he spends that much time at the line, 
And also, like, he ain't stepping back. He's just more working at the line. Like, Tyke told me he's always teaches, man, like, take your time at the line. Like, have right. a plan. After that plan goes, you got to have another plan. After that plan fails, have another one. Just always, it's, it's basketball on grass when you're at the receiver position. Mm -hmm. Stevie Johnson, my dog, like. He was a, he was a he dog was with Buffalo. Was, was Boy, he dog. Real, what he like, five minutes? No, no, Steve was 6'1", 6'2". He was, but, I don't know why I thought he was Cats small. don't know he this. The <laughs> and me and Roscoe Paris was literally talking about this on the phone the other day. I was talking to Roscoe about a month ago. I'm recruiting his son. Stevie was the best, like, hands down, press release receiver I've ever seen in life. Like, Damn. Damn. he was the first cat I really paid attention to. And you can ask cats this. I'm not lying. And I, and I, I will let you see this. Like, I watch, like, start the hezzy, like, that hezzy trend. Yeah. Just understanding with the hezzy and the crossover. But it was always forward. Steve never went backwards. Like, never took a false step. Everything was always attacking vertically. Even when he gave you the hezzy and he crossed you over, he was moving forward. And that's the thing I think. That's the only thing the kids don't understand. Like, they don't understand, like, timing. And, yes, you can use hezzy and all those tricks. But it still has to understand that a clock has to go off in your, your head. head. Yeah, that you hey, gotta move forward. The ball is here, so I need you to be here. To now, when that drop is there, you're not there. Then we off you. Mm -hmm. Like when we was in Buffalo, we played in the St. Louis room, St. Le St. Louis Rams offense. That was an old Mark Mike Martz. Mike Martz. Uh, what was called on Greatest Show Greatest turf. 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 Yeah. yeah, but all that stuff people don't realize that like that whole offense was structured off steps. Like it was steps and the drops compared. Like, they tied in everything. So, like, the office is hard as I don't know what. We had, like, say, you did a route tree, and it was route trees at the time. Like, you ran a four route. Okay, four route was what? A dig. Dig. And that offense, dig route was a short four. You got a big four. You got a spin four. Dang. You got a cut four. You have a witch count. And all of it was based on steps. It was no breakdown. You had to speed cut a lot of that stuff. It was fourth outside, fourth inside. Like, you had three to four different routes of each route tree of each route concept. And so you had to understand, if you was not at the proper place, oh, he was coming in, hey, I need to bring guys in. What's up? I got the playbook. Bring me some more receivers in. I'm getting rid of you. Like, it was like that. And so kids understand, like, and that's with me. Like, I was like, okay. But you still had a time, enough time to, like, you know, you're, okay, if you spent time at the line, you got to speed up your route. Like, you have to quicken up your route. Mm -hmm. And kids don't understand that. And they be like, well, coach, you ain't let me. I don't mind you getting, you know, whatever you want to call it, like, Getting, getting busy at the line or whatever, but you got to understand, like, it's a purpose. Like, you have to have a plan, that and moves. you have to get to this spot before not with sack. Like, we don't have all that time. So just understand and taking waste of motion out. Like, you got waste of motion, I'm, hey, give me 10. Like, you got to get off. Like, no waste of motion. Like, everything we have to do, we have to tax for. That goes back to that Anquan Bolden deal. Mm -hmm. Like, Anquan yeah. was just, he wasn't a speed guy. Mm -hmm. But Anquan would get deep on catch. Steve wasn't a speed guy. Steve would tell you, but Steve would go forward, be the guy at the line, and that's when I earned it, like understood like separation. Like I was a fast guy, yeah, I was four four, but I didn't even really have to play four four because I understand like if you get separation at the top of the route, that's all you need. Like understanding like everybody look like I'm running, but I'm not. Like Cass understand like Steve running, but he ain't like he's in his own zone. But the DB in phase, he's grinding, he digging, and then Steve hit him with a uh uh inside out or outside in and then it's over with like working the box like kids don't understand those things right like that's why i don't for me i don't teach my guys i don't pigeonhole them like okay you run a curl you got to release inside nah, like why would i do that now i'm setting you up for failure because the minute that kid play hard inside you have no plan on how to get him if he was inside mm -hmm. like now nah, let him play inside we'll go outside now we want to get him deep we want to sell the go and then now once we get him on our hip we throw by now we work the curl mm -hmm. you know just understanding right. having different aspects but we can't do that if we're working backwards. We can't do that if we hadn't closed the cushion and now we heads in, but we heads in five yards away. DB, wait, no, you can heads in all day. I'm going to sit here. Like, I ain't even moving. I'm going to wait, on, yeah, wait on you. That's the same that D line. Like, if you got if the, if the O line, O tackle is vertical setting, and you make that inside move five yards away, all you're going to do is sit on you. Yeah, well, like, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. They're going to take you where you want to go. Like, okay, appreciate you. Yeah, like, get him off his shit. Got to get him off his spot. Get him off. Like, I always teach him, like, Get him off his landmark. Make him uncomfortable. Right. Like, once you get him off his landmark and make him uncomfortable, now you got him. And now you know where you're going. He don't. He's uncomfortable. Now he's frantic because he's trying to figure out, okay, where he going? Where he going? In. Where he going? Like, so that's the biggest thing. Like, no wasted motion. You know, one thing, too, I started know, I started seeing a lot now with with uh, receivers, and it's starting, to, it's starting to, like, trickle into the league. Oh, no, no. Starting to see a lot of body catching. 
Oh like, yeah, like <laughs> it's not. It's no. It's like you don't see the don't Fitzgerald, see no the the the, nah. the um. Reggie Wayne was was big was big like that whole that whole generation like yeah. all the top dogs when they were coming when they was coming from, back from the curl you seen the diamond come you thought they were with the Rockefellers yeah. you know what I'm saying now nah, they just like they letting the ball get all up on them and like trying to just trap it and stuff no most it's like there's no pure hand catchers so I think like like talk about no more so I think got a few now hold on I say I say you that's why I said not many I say but it's it's mo- it's a lot but of I bodies. would say I think the biggest thing that's tough for those kids is like. When I first got receiver, like, I, I didn't wear gloves. Like, in college, I did not wear gloves. The only thing I wore was tape around the finger. So when I put gloves on, like, I was like, that's uncomfortable. That's weird. Name me how many kids y'all seen in college or league right now that don't wear gloves. They all wear, they all wear gloves. gloves. So they all wear gloves. Even though, and, and then I ended up wearing gloves in the league. And it helps you, you know, it stops the ball when it got to speed. You know, it slows it down. But it really, you don't have to squeeze as strong as if you caught the ball with your hands. So just think, like, we ain't have gloves when we was in the backyard. Like, you play. Right. You catch the ball. Have you catch the ball? You know someone, your older brother, threw that ball hard to you. What you had to do when to catch that ball? You got to give with it because if not, he going to bust your chest right. Right. wide open or he going to bust your mouth open. So they don't do that. Like, with the gloves, you can snap it and snatch it right then and there. You don't have to give with the ball. So now a lot of those things, those tips and trick tricks that you're learning, you don't. Like, I always tell kids, treat your eyes like a camera. Like, take a picture of it every time you catch the ball. Like, every time the ball coming in, you always take a snapshot of, snapshot of the frame. We don't do that anymore. Like, they don't have to. So now I think the gloves, I think the gloves is the biggest issue because they don't really have to squeeze as much. The gloves kind of stop a lot of the impact, and also now you don't have to embrace with the ball. So now when some of those kids get some of those high-traffic catches, like, they don't really know how to kind of function in that way. So this is more about now, like, a lot of receiver coaches. And I, one of my guys that played for me, he, or uh, my receiver coach, now he played for me. So now he'll teach a lot of those things. Like, yeah, it's certain positions like we have to body catch. Josh Reed used to teach me that all the time. Working in the slot, hey, that's when you body catch because you're going to take a shot. You take a shot. On the perimeter, yeah, like you, you catch with your hands. Like you out there by yourself, ain't nobody out there with you. You pluck it. Like T.O. used to pluck the hell out the ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he's the body catch too, though. Yeah, yeah he, did. Know, he did. One of the hardest working cats I ever watched in the league, man. Like T.O. is the, man, good dude. Whatever people say about him is super false. But like hardest working cat. Like, T.O. would run reps, reps, reps. Even when OTAs, when older guys ain't had to beat up, man, he was still a, like, So grinding. damn sheep. Oh, man, so much. I mean, run, go, Ross. T.O. used to run. <laughs> People don't know this. Rob Roy know this, too. T.O. used to practice in the old, old line cleats, them old heavy bottom, molded bottom cleats. Ugh, them, the the heavy, high top. That high, high tops. Top. Them 90 boys that, that everybody's still well with the yeah. hard, heavy molded. Yeah. Used to practicing them. No lie. I'm like, we used to be like, man, what you doing, man? I'm finna, I'm finna practice and eat, man. Like, T.O. was country, country, Chattanooga, Alabama. Man, what you talking about? And we'll go out there and raw cats up. Like, with the hip <laughs> bottom on. Come out of comebacks, like, and dig. And I'm like, man, this dude, he a freak. Like, <laughs> he's sick. Why you think? And this is my last one. This is my last question. But I got to get your, your take on it. Why do, Why is it every year somebody's projected to go, say, second, third round? Soon as they test and run a, a, a fast 40, they shoot up to the first round. Mm-hmm. Like Brian Thomas. Like yeah. a lot of people had him slotted going early, second, middle of the second. Now they're saying he's going top 15. Mm-hmm. Why, why does the league put so much emphasis on that 40 yard dash? It's just hard to not like speed kills. Like either you got it or you don't. But like, what happened to just but it, the tape on? But the, <laughs> it, it, and, and it's true. No, I, 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 gee, I hundred percent agree with you. Like, yeah. like, I'm just trying not to say names. Like, I know cats like that had that fast forty, but it just didn't translate. Like, yeah, John Ross. Processing. John Ross was one uh, that four two, but just couldn't. <sighs> it's just hard. Like, either you're born with speed or you're not. If you can cultivate like Tyreek Hill, then now you got a player like Tyreek Hill. Mm-hmm. Oh, a guy out of Baylor. Most explosive. Corey Coleman. Corey Coleman was another one. Like, man. Had that fast forward. But they couldn't. The first round. It couldn't translate. But it's just hard. Like, speed kills. And only so many people have it. And then now when you get a guy like Brian Thomas, who's 6'4", 220, and really? running 4'3", and he looked like maybe the next incarnation of Moss, right. possibly. Like, I mean, they gone. Like, you, not, you can't get, like, that's just like Vince Young and Cam Newton. Like, people talk about Cam. Like, Cam, if you've ever seen Cam in person, like, 
Kim huge. is this huge. enormously yes. huge. Yes. He's huge. Human being. Yes. He like just can't run 4-5. He probably be, be a yeah. DN. Yeah, he's <laughs> a DN. But he runs 4-5. Like, just seeing a cat like that, you know he has leadership qualities. Like, people don't know Cam work his butt off. Like Cam in the gym, I mean, in the, in the office watching film at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. And now he has that size, speed, strength, wingspan, height, weight ratio. Mindset. Like you just, you salivate over that. And even for us, like, we see it, but it's just more of like, okay, what is your core values? Like, okay, what do you value more? Do you value speed? Or is speed just a bonus to whatever the other thing that you value more in the receiver? Right. And that's the kind of thing that you they have to decide. Like, and that's more up to them than I think at that me. combine, like, I get an example. We, you know, get ready to wrap up. But Puka Nakuni, right? He mm-hmm. runs this four five five. I didn't even know about that catch. But at during that gauntlet that they have at the combine, you mm-hmm. know, they, they do the they do the catch and do the catch, and they kind of run straight, and they're trying to measure how fast a guy can run, mm-hmm. like miles per hour wise. Yep. But he had the fastest time. Was I think. He, I was think. He, was he fastest? Corey Coleman. Corey Coleman did it. Corey Coleman was the fastest too. this year. Yeah. Okay. 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 Corey Coleman was the fastest. You yeah. know, Keon. Well, yeah, Keon, Keon was like third. Keon, 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 Keon Coleman was the fastest this year. Second. Or first. No, he was first, first this year. Keon, he was first. Keon Coleman. Keon Coleman. Yes. Yes. Keon Coleman was the fastest this year. But last year, in that same gauntlet, Puka Canute. Puka Canute. Ah. Nakua. Nakua ran the fastest, and he ran a four five five. But to go to that credit, he's the number one rookie receiver. Out of all the receivers last year for the Rams, mm-hmm. he puts up fourteen hundred yards. Mm-hmm. He's the one having all the receptions. But right? it, it goes to, look at the system he played in. Right. Versus, well, it ain't really versus. the system though. It's more of like he said, kind of like that guy. Literally, he can still play for run four or five and mm-hmm. still play four or five. And that goes now to more of probably that cerebral aspect that he has. Yeah. To play as well, like hey. Going through the gauntlet, like he never probably he didn't wave off. He the didn't line. wave off the line. He didn't weave off the line. He was straightforward, and he played at that same speed. Them same cats that ran four two. I was waving, back and look at waving. Them. How much they weaved and weaving, how weaving. fast were they going? Troy, when they caught that ball, Troy Franklin was the, one of the fastest guys. Well, Morgan, there. Morgan, mm-hmm. <laughs> bobbing and weaving. Really, mm-hmm. I watched it. Trust me, mm-hmm. <laughs> I watched it too. I, and I and I I think that. Them saying Keon probably get pushed himself out of the first round because he ran a full six mm-hmm. is an injustice. It's because, an injustice because yeah, because I think he has a great chance to be the next Brandon Marshall. You seen Week One? Oh, he's a strong run, he's a strong receiver, physical. They got like, a chance. I did, think he can did too. You see Sam week a little one. more speed than him. Yeah. Yeah. I think more than Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, to me, the biggest indicator that I like at receivers, I just like the, their first ten. Like yeah. I want to see how you explode off the ball. Mm-hmm. And then the the most important thing that I look for in receivers. Within that testing, it ain't really that forty three cone short shuttle. Short shuttle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I want in and out, in and out, in and out. You cut the brakes. That's me. Like you get out the brakes. Like I got a kid right now, and that's stuff we work in the train for him. So Trey don't mind me telling this. Trey, we tested him the other day. Trey ran like literally four or five flat, but then he short shuttle like four eight, and that's just he can't get out of the brakes. Like the he brakes. can't stop and change direction. Like that's what you want. Like in that direction. Kid, I'll take a kid to run high four or five. But if he can tell me, okay, if he's a receiver, he can go sub four, like four one zero and sub blow. Oh, I'll take him all day because now I know once he stick his toe on the ground, he can get in and out of yeah, that break. breaks. And now he can create that separation because the key is at the end is just the separation. Mm-hmm. Like even if you afford, like Steve, Steve, I think Steve ran four, high four five, but Steve knew that if I get you at the line, my burst and my first step was enough to create the separation with whatever speed I had. That's all I needed. And if Lee Evans was the same way. Like, Lee, Lee Evans was a deep ball. Mm-hmm. Like, from Wisconsin, huh? From Wisconsin. 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 Ran 4-3. Mm-hmm. But Lee's first step was good, and he knew that, okay, as long as I can create separation at the top of the route, whatever I'm doing, that's all it is. That's all I need. Like, all these stuff that I learned from these cats, man, I was just always a sponge. And so just now understanding, like, but Lee's short shuttle was below four flat. I think Lee did, like, 401 up. I think 399. And that's from Wisconsin. Like, was moving. Like, T.O. short shoulder, like, is blow itself for a flat. Like, get in and out. Josh Reed was the same way. Wasn't a burner, but Josh can get in right. and out of breaks. Like, that's the key measurement for me on how successful a receiver. And, not, well, it's not the most important thing, but, but one of the key important yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Like how he gets in and out of his breaks. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Got to, get, got to get into FT's favors, man. Before we shut it down, here we go. Here we go. Favorite football player of all time, no matter what level. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Randy Moss. 
Flip flops. Randy Moss. And Jer- and and I was tough because I'm a 49er fan through and through. And Jerry Rice was. You a 49 fan? Yes, I am. Sorry for you. I know. And I'm, mm. I'm not a big Purdy fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I understand, like. <sighs> you should you shouldn't be mad at Purdy. You should be mad at Kyle Shanahan for the third Super Bowl in, the, Ooh, in, in a row that he had. His, he did. He, he did. stops he did. running the ball. He did. He, he did. pissed down his legs. And, and honestly, Randy was a San Fran. He didn't get to do what he did, too. But Randy Moss and me is like. I watched this cat score three touchdowns in one half on some Buffalo. I was on Peace Squad at that time, and I got to see it live in 3D, and that cat is sick. Man. Yeah. Like, I'm talking about, and I'm talking about, like, <laughs> he had one play. He literally they snapped the ball, and after three steps, he threw his hand up. Like, that old, like, when you heard people say, no, it, it's true. Threw his hand up. We had over-top coverage of everything. He lit us up. He, he was out the game in the fourth in the third quarter. Like, he had four touchdowns, three in the first half. Like, he lit us up. The same oh, he did that. Yeah. Yeah. That's when he was the Patriots? Yes. That was a, that was the year when he I remember was great. They should have won it, too. They were sick, though, man. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, God. God. We had Brandon Jacobs on. He was uh yes. he was talking, yeah, yeah. He was talking that shit. <laughs> we talking that shit. We talking that shit. Nobody could stop Moss that year, man. Right. He was on He was on one. And then they had Wes Welk in the, in the slide. Right. And like, right. Man, yeah. he, he, was on, he was on a whole different. It was on a different atmosphere, man. And, and even with him and Dante Culpepper that time, like, it was sick, too. But oh, Culpepper, yeah. Get, Culpepper yeah. was slinging it. Yo, and, and that little one year with uh, Randall Williams. He realized, like, Culpepper but, was that dude. But see, like, but that, he was that, Cam before Cam. He was that, Cam before that, Cam. That yes. Corey. Um, Chris Carter, Jake Reed. Well, Jake that, Reed out of ground. Yeah. Like, yeah. You had Robert Smith in yeah. the backfield. Yeah, they, that, was was tough, yeah. that was a tough Vikings uh-huh. team. Yeah, yeah. Favorite sneak all time. Oh, the Jordan threes. The you want threes, the, the threes? Man, you want the threes? I'm a three threes. guy. Uh, thirteen patent leather breads is the second one, but the threes is you ain't lying. Three's comfortable, man. Like, like you can wear them. Thirteen, the yeah. The thirteen, <laughs> the thirteen, yeah. That ain't something. Yeah, me a <laughs> Favorite place to visit? <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> Vegas, man, like Ten City, man. I haven't been Vegas days in Vegas, man. I, we, I, I think for. a Maybe eleven year stretch, twelve year stretch. I went every year at least twice a year. Mm-hmm. I love that place, man. Mm-hmm. It's just fun. It's just a different vibe. Mm-hmm. It's cool. It's chill. Nice little atmosphere. I was young at the time too, and, and so we just went out there and had fun. No so doubt. It was, it was cool. Vegas. Vegas was probably first place. Uh, Bali was the second place. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Favorite coach of all time that made the most impact on you, no matter what level. Man. <laughs> um, man, that's tough. I never even thought about that question. I would say, I would say everybody, man. Like, I guess everybody along my journey, I I picked up jewels from, Mm -hmm. man. I can't equate more than other, because everybody, I learned something from what it was. Everybody had a a unique impact impact on me, man. Even the ones, I always say, man, like being a head coach, like, I, I mean, I don't know all the answers, but I do understand that I've been around a lot of coaches, and I've watched how some of them do great, I watched some of them do not so great, and I watched some of them being different. So I I got the best learning experience ever, and even when the ones that didn't do as great or did treat the kids like I learned from them. And so for me, just right. each and every step of the way, just try to learn. And I just pick one thing from them. So I would just say everybody had an impact on me, man, because I've always I knew how important a coach would be, um, and how important a coach is in your life. And you know that's your that's like your second brother. Friends, father, 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 sometimes, like you know, so all of for it. me, all of them, kind of, they were a vital impact for me, man, and and you know, for me, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't take the journey that I did. Let me let me let me put my chest up. <laughs> Put my chest. I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. Go ahead, G. Lay, lay it on. Favorite comedian of all time. God damn it, Martin Lawrence. Oh, shit. I'm a Martin let me, fan. Let me go ahead. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. I'm a, I'm a Martin a fan. One, through, I mean, we grew up through that era when yeah. Martin mm-hmm. was it. Uh, Martin did Eddie Murphy. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. And Jack it. There you go. Yeah. Hey, man. Well, who, who was yours? <laughs> Bernie Mac. Oh, Bernie's, Bernie's in the top three, too. I'm I, First of all, I, like, I'm a stand-up comedian. Like, yeah. like I love it. Like, I, I used to... Man, I still yeah. do. Like, anytime a comedy show come in town, like, I go see. Like, Cat one was down here Saturday. Yeah, like, Cat was down here Saturday, I heard. Mm-hmm. Um, like, Nate, uh, Nate like Jackson, man, man. Um, D.L. Hughley. Like, all those cats, man. man like, he, he, 
I like DL. He look you hating on DL. You gotta stop. Gotta stop. You gotta stop that. You gotta stop that. It ain't, it ain't nice. Like Bill Burr. Like I like yeah, Bill Burr. Bill Burr is like, funny. Like a hilarious. Bill Burr is funny. Like, I'm just a fan of stand-up comedy. Like, but DL need to be in a clique. Like, it can't just be DL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. DL need a couple. Yeah, he's like Mike Epps too. Like yeah. Mike Epps can't write really. I like Mike Epps as a clowner. But when he writes his stuff, it's kind of leaving yeah. a lot to be desired. He got right. to go off. Yeah, he got to go off script. Yeah. Mm, right. Yeah. I love stand-up comedy, though, man. Like, I man, I got a chance to first see Chris Tucker and and and, 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 and Martin Lawrence when they first came back. So I got a chance to see. That's mine. Chris Tucker is mine. Chris was mine, but then he kind of went Muslim. He went, <laughs> 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 went Muslim. Hey, you got a little Muslim blind going on today yourself. <laughs> Bee pies, my brother. <laughs> I look at the weather report. The temperature is about to go and drop later on. We're going to drop a little later, man. You know what I'm saying? I think laughter is good for the soul, man. Yeah. So anytime you get to laugh and stuff like that, like I love stand-up comedy. So anytime yeah. I – being in Atlanta was great when I got a chance to live there because Uptown Comedy Club, everybody – Everybody come through there. And you can come through. You catch a comic through – I mean, the lowest – I mean, I got to see Kevin Hart for $20 one time when he first on the come up. And that was before he got mainstream. And just seeing cats come through there, like $20, $25, Uptown Comedy Club in Atlanta. So just living in different places, man, that was a real good thing. So I love stand-up comedy. Your favorite sports move? Ooh, program. There we go. Let's go. Program. Let's go. Side note, kids don't know nothing about the program mm-hmm. right now, mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. They don't know it. Like, I, like, literally every year, Alex, man. it don't matter where you at, if you got a long bus ride, you tell them, hey, what we watching? Tell them watch the program. Call what that is. And they won't know. Like, they don't know about Alvin Mack. Mm-hmm. They don't know about Latimer. Mm-hmm. Hell, we all thought we was Donnell Jefferson. Right. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Not in the backyard. Hey, set him up. Bro. Right. Oh, set him up. Hell yeah, no doubt. Donnell Jefferson but, was a but dog, don't man. But they many sports movies. No. And then even the ones they make, they all feel good. Yeah, yeah, they all kind of like, okay, you got the problem kids or whatever. And then, like, nah, that ain't really real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, nah. Rudy, Rudy, an uh, inspiring movie for me. Yes. That's yeah. a yeah. movie. Yeah. Rudy, yeah. That, that, I mean, you you want to talk about perseverance. Oh, no doubt. You want to talk about heart of a lion. You want to talk about somebody that beat the eyes. Right. Boy, when the, boy that know the day. Oh, know the day. <laughs> <laughs> when know the day. Nah, boy, well, about four nine. Right. <laughs> oh, he was. Nice. Guys, and, and, and his head beating every day at practice. Correct then. I, I like I like I like Invincible too. Invincible was good. Mm-hmm. It was good. Invincible was good. Mm-hmm. Invincible was good. I mean, we grew up on like Mighty Ducks and all that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chips. Blue yeah. chips. I like blue chips. Like I like those those old college movies. Like I love the program. I love blue chips because it honestly was when you got into college, you got to see it was kind of like that. Yep. Not at our level, right? Right. But like understanding, like yeah, all that stuff was true. Like mm-hmm. you hear those stories. Yeah. Under the table, like yeah. those old days. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, you put the money in the back pocket. Yeah. yeah. Leave it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got the, the bag. Hash, and the handshake. Hand 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 and all this stuff was true. So, mm-hmm. nah, I love movies like that, man. But the program was it for me. Gotcha. Like, program was it. Toughest DB you ever faced. <laughs> like, when you went home, you was like, man, that motherfucker. Okay, I'll give you two. Tough. Well, I got, I got, I got okay. a second part question. Okay. And then, toughest player you coached against. When you was game planning, mm-hmm. you watching him on film, you like, man, I don't know what we gonna do with this cat. And then after the game, after you play, after you coached against him, you like, damn, it, it, nothing worked. Okay, I got two. DB I faced was um, in college. I'll go college first. In college, it was a mix out of David Pittman, who David Pittman from right down the road. Um, I think David went to David Pittman, Lutcher or St. James. So he was, I he, think. He went played in Northwestern. Was second round pick in uh, Northwestern he, State. He's Kirsten Pittman's cousin. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kirsten Pittman. Okay. Cousin. David okay. Pittman was second round pick out of Northwestern State. Mm. D-, D. Pitt was nice. I got him the second time. The last time we played him. First time he lit me up. For real? Yeah, he did. And then, or oh, the, the, the side note was Keith Smith from McNeese. The McNeese, first from McNeese. Yep. He was another second round pick. That second round pick. I lit him. I got him too, but he was tough. Like I only got two catches. Now. I got two big ones, but he was locking me up most of the game. Uh, and then in the league, man, hardest person I went was Sheen Mathis. And that was just, that was kind of my Jackson. welcome. Yes, but that was just my welcome going into the league. Side note, like, coming in as an undrafted cat, small school, you really don't know nothing. Like, right. I didn't understand. Like, I didn't know nothing. Like, I was uh, I was super raw. Like, I, I thought I knew it all when I was in college. Going to that level and understand, like, the, how you got to prepare, like, I was on a whole nother level. So, Sheen Mathis was literally, he was 6'3". 
yeah. 210. Can he can jam you from five yards away. And so I'm coming with my little, and I got my speed, and literally, huh? He stopped me, like, right there. I'm like, okay, this shit's different. <laughs> <laughs> and what he went to, to Tuskegee? He went to Tuskegee. No, Bethune Cookman. Bethune Cookman. Bethune Cookman. And was a dog, man. Now, hardest player I'll coach again, I wouldn't say player. This was my welcome, welcome moment as an OC at the Division One level. We played South Carolina, and that's when they had Javon Kentlaw. They had uh, oh. Deion Sound. The other uh, Shiloh. Shiloh was there. They had uh, uh, what was the one? JC Horn. JC Horn was there. Oh. They had the other cat on the other side of him with a six four. They had all them cats on the perimeter. Oh, uh, he played for Dallas. He no, lived with Dallas. Dallas. With a long last name. Long last, long last name. name. Yeah, he, yeah, I yeah. yeah Parkway. No. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, he, 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 made he, he made that Parkway. He made that Parkway. He sure did. That Parkway. It's man or something. He got a long last name. Yeah, he gave you something. Yeah, he played that Parkway. Exactly. He played that Parkway with Justin and Terry. Yeah, and so that was my incarnation. I'm sitting there like, okay, you at that level. And hindsight, I'm telling our guys, like, hey, we go to the league. When you play against those bitches, like, some of them don't be what they – what you see on TV. Mm -hmm. Like, you play against him. Like, I remember the first time I went against D. Webb, and I'm thinking, like, oh, snap, D. Webb was that dude at Florida. I lit him up. And he was like, okay, but it is normal. But now, these cats, like, you understand, like, Javon Kenlaw, like, we schemed up a perfect game plan. Like, our first play, literally, it was what they lined up in, what we wanted to see, everything. But it was Jimmy's versus Joe's. Javon Kenlaw, literally. Uh Uh-huh. <laughs> Mac, my quarterback. Oh, in the first play, we hit outside zone for 40. And we finna drop. I really, I knew what we knew what they would do. We game plan, really. But it was just like, them cats different, man. <laughs> them cats were different. And so that's when you realize, like, hey, sometimes, like, it's just, that yeah, cat just got. Cat yeah. different. Yeah, he's cat different. different. And they all were like that. Javon Kenlaw, like a double team. Like, we had him. Like, we knew. Uh-uh. J.C. Horn. Cam Brown was 6'4". And we had the one-on-one favor, and Cam had them. It was 100% all year. Mm-mm. He was working, Cam. Like, that's what we knew, just like, it don't matter what we attack. Like, we just ain't got it. Right. <laughs> like, right. that's what you I mean, They got more than you got. Like, we just ain't got it. You know what happened? <laughs> <laughs> let's get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. We're like, okay, hey, let's run the ball. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, and sure enough, they, right. J.C. Hong. They, 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 put up, pick. they put up enough <laughs> points on him there. <laughs> yeah. Like, on that, what's the point of the light when he told him, say, all right, go. Oh, man. He had, had, had enough. <laughs> pick him up. Take him on in. <laughs> if Felton Huggins... Didn't play football and wasn't coaching football. What would Felton Huggins be doing with his life? Teacher. Teacher. Teacher, man. Teacher. I just all Educator. Know. Educator, man. Like, that's just my whole family in education. Like, that's just, even right now, I got a niece that's a teacher. Um, All my cousins and my uh, my sister, she's a teacher's aide at an elementary school. Like, we just love kids, man. And so, uh, even my mom's side of the family, they got teachers in their family. So, for me, I would just I'd probably be teaching. Like, I probably would, man. That's be a principal. Yeah. I hope I wouldn't be a principal. Like, <laughs> and I, I, I know I know the story of my dad coming down the hallway with the rock ports and the walkie-talkie. Yeah, <laughs> he said a rock ports. Hey, that's man, like, supposed to be my shoes. They come, like, hey, I got a couple pair of rock ports. No <laughs> fuck, man. And he yeah. comes over there. My dad got bad feet, so he walked kind of hard. But one thing kids knew, like, my dad, again, he was firm, but he was fair. But he'll, hey, son, get out the hallway. You know, he come, he hold that walkie-talkie like that, and, he was at Scotlandville, McKinley, and all these schools, man. But he was at some rough places. Some rough places. <laughs> me for real. One thing they they knew, like my dad, like he would still get calls to come be principal at schools because they knew how much of a disciplinary he was, and he knew that it wasn't gonna be like no strong arm of the law. It was just a hey, we gotta do this this way. Like there's no other way. Like he set the standards. He was intentional about being clear about how he said things and how we're gonna do things and just do stuff the right way. That's all he asked. Other than that, he wouldn't bother you. He'll love on you, all that stuff, but long as we doing stuff the right way. And that's why I always tell my guy, like, hey, just do it the right way. You will never hear anything out of me if we ain't doing it the right way. Right. We're going to laugh and joke and have fun, but just if we mess up, like, learn from it, own up to it. I'm going to tell you when you're wrong. Let's figure out how we're going to do it and just move forward. So I would probably be teaching, man. I just, I love kids, man. I see it. I see it. That's my passion. Man, man I, kids, I don't want the one talk. I don't want to fucking talk you. I don't want one. Don't even give me a bullhorn. <laughs> hey, kids. <laughs> I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this podcast, bro. Uh, uh, one of my favorite ones. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I just think back. I was talking to Brennan. 
Oh, Harris. I thought the big call a month ago because I'm actually recruiting some kids from Carl. Yeah. Uh, on the way up and I was telling, I told him I was gonna have you on here. He was like, "Come on, man." I'm like, "Yeah." And we just was thinking back, reminiscing on the South Eastern days, and we talked about the Magnese game when y'all man. went upset at him and stuff like that. And man, just to see where you at now versus when you was playing in South Eastern, I remember you know us interacting in, in, in college and stuff like that. It, it it makes you reflect and appreciate relationships. Oh, 100%, 100%. yeah, you know what I mean. And I tell I tell kids I mentor all the time, like bro, you you meet people when you go to college that that that's lifelong relationships. Relationship. You know what I mean. And you was always a good dude, bro. And to see what you're doing now, um, you know, forty one year old head coach at the HBCU, like Kentucky State. Um, I know y'all went three and seven this year, but I know good things is to come for that program, and I I know. You are the person to turn that program around, and uh, I know God got big things for you in the future. I appreciate that, man. I, first and foremost, man, I'm always giving thanks. So I just want to tell you guys, man. First and foremost, I appreciate you guys. Let me even be on your platform for real. I'm I'm very appreciative of understanding of people's time. Like time is precious. Time is the essence. Like you could be doing anything else in the world, but you guys gave me a moment to not only just talk about me, but just talk about again. If you notice, I'm gonna talk about my program, my kids. You got to. So got to. Got to. Them, man, that's. That's important to me, and I'm intentional about giving thanks for that. So, man, I just want to say appreciate you guys. And it's just always been love. I love where I'm from, man. Like, I got to tell people, like, man, Louisiana, even though we got it, it's tough here, and we don't have a lot of things. But one of the things I know we do, like, it's a village mentality. Yeah. And when we cross paths with people, yep. and you know them, you probably know them, like, crazy part about it. Like, if you don't know them personally, Someone in your family, some friend, yeah. somebody else, and some somebody in Louisiana. Yeah. Like, and so you got a relationship with them, man. That's it. And so the biggest thing is just like, man, like I tell a kid, like, man, where you from? Like when I recruit kids back here, oh, I know your dad. Like I used to watch him. I played against him. Mm -hmm. I, I know I played with him. And so for me, it's just like once I have that relationship of any inkling or even if I know about you, like for me, it's just, okay, what I got to do to help take care of my community. And Louisiana is my community, man. And this is the place that bred me to get to where I am and bred a lot of us. And so I'm I'm appreciative of that, man. So I just say thank you all. Oh, man, I appreciate you, bro. It's always been all love, man. And, and Southeastern, oh, man. How, when we got so many there, memories. Man, so many so memories, many. man. I mean, just think, like. So many. Just in life, like, when we got there, like, they didn't even have ball. Right. Like, people don't even realize, like, like those kids now don't understand, like, they didn't even have a football team. When I transferred there, that just doesn't let you know how, how God works, man. Like. I transferred to Southeast before they even got football. Oh. So I didn't even know. Like, I just, honestly, again, how we were raised, okay, you don't play football, you play another sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, go run track or go play basketball. Yep. So I went there to run track. And just life and your path and your journey kind of intertwined us. And who would have thought I'd have met Jacoby Jones and ran with him, and now he's going a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. And that's my dog. Right. Like, and we were together. Right. And all and all the people that came through Southeast, like, if, Everybody that would have played that came through Southeast and like at Graham and that Southeast, like we had cats that like you and a bunch of cats that didn't even get out there. But what if all these other cats came and played? Like, mm -hmm. and we probably been a powerhouse, powerhouse, player. right? And that just let go to show, like in Louisiana, like the toughest part is it's so many talented kids that can play. Yes, indeed. At this level, like I always tell people, like I'm not the best person where I'm from. Only thing that me for me that I was able to make it was it's just the choices that we all make in life. Yep. life. Like, and, yep. and some of the choices I made, they didn't cost me. A lot of my friends' choices they made, some of them they might have cost them or they just didn't try to apply themselves. And But to me, like, I'm not the best person where I'm from. Hell, we literally, we've had at Northeast High School, within a 20-year span, we won state in the 100-meter dash at least off 10 out of the 20 years, and we've had the fastest kid in the, in the state and one in the nation. Trenton Holidays was my little cousin. Carl Kelly, who won a 100-meter dash at a 10-3 when I was in school during that time. Then we had Trenton Holiday's little brother. He ran it. We had another kid after him. All those kids came out of the pipeline of Northeast of where we from and what, all, the, all the talent we have there. And now, you know, Zachary kind of got our talent, but that's a whole nother yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. But, like, man, well, just. conversation. They didn't, they didn't put a, they didn't put a, they didn't put a fence in everything. Fence and all wrong so, that talent in, yeah. in Baton Rouge. But all that talent was at Southeastern, man. And mm -hmm. all the cats were at Southeastern. We had a ton of talent, man. And I could just only imagine if all of them would have got out there. But, you know, life didn't make it that way. But at the end of the day, we all kind of crossed paths. Mm -hmm. Everybody we were cool with, we kicked it with, we hung with. We mm -hmm. all spent time together, man, and it brought us to where we at to this point, man. And so along the journey, man, that's all we can ask for. Man. For real. And that's so, all you can. Like, I, I'm proud of, and I'm happy. I, 
I mean, I know I want to I always want to stay at HBCU, but again, I understand the journey I'm at and what kind of turns all he's into HBCU on a cool on a cool. Only time I seen white people was in class. So that is true. And honestly, even homecoming, like Bro, homecoming. Oh, I haven't been a homecoming in five years, but the last one I went to, it was lit. It was lit. Like, it ain't just, it ain't just like, HBCU. Man, I'm man. telling you, it was lit. Hey, you're thinking you on the yard. It ain't an HBCU. on the yard. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't <laughs> an HBCU homecoming. And they, now I heard they like, everybody got to go in the game now. Like, they just see, trying see, not to. See, see, yeah, y'all got, it ain't an HBCU homecoming. Nah. <laughs> well, see, HBCU, the only thing the issue over there is we can't get Austin coming to the game. You gonna kick it out on the tailgate yeah, all day, yeah, all day, yeah, all day. Yeah, come, that, tick, that ticket sale ain't gonna, gonna be eight nah, no, 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 no. We ain't going to get. It's gonna be light. <laughs> it's gonna be, yeah, the game gonna be light. When we, the game ain't like when you. Light. Game gonna be light. When you go out, they are gonna come in right, right before halftime half time. to see the band, to see the alumni band. You gonna see them sprinkle back outside and go get. Y'all got, y'all got a hill. Yes, yes. Turn hills. We in the mountains of Kentucky. I'm gonna say turn turn your hill to a Greek hill. Why we had it? Oh, in the stadium. No, we ain't got one. I yeah. wish we could. Alcorn that. got that. Yeah, That's yeah. why. So, yeah. we went to one of y'all. Before we played y'all in 04, me, Jeff, a couple of us, we had the bye week. And we went to y'all game. Y'all played Southern. First of mm. all, when Alcorn played Southern, that's mm. a whole nother animal. Mm-hmm. Like that down game. 61. Oh, man. And first of all, the game be crunk. Yeah. And so, man, we went there and we was like, God damn. Like, right. <laughs> like, it was, I'm talking about all on the hill. Like, we had to park, like, two miles away, and we walking in, and in this atmosphere, it was like, man, I need this. Like, <laughs> I, like in our games at the time, I mean, we probably had the most packed games in Southeastern. Now they kind of light, but yeah. but that atmosphere, we weren't getting that. And now that's why a lot of the PWIs, they try to play us because we bring that atmosphere. Like, that is our culture. We bring that to them, mm-hmm. and I yeah. want that. Like, we bring the fans to them. So, mm-hmm. yes, man, that that game was crunk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what it is, man. <laughs> Y'all already know what it is. This is FanView Podcast. Listen, get subscribed. Get locked in FanView Podcast if you're on YouTube. FanView Podcast if you're on Facebook. FanView Podcast if you're on TikTok. We're still FanView Nola on X. And we're FanView Podcast on Facebook. Get the like, subscribe. Listen to us on your Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify. You name it. We there. Don't forget to follow my man G Sports. You know it. Yo, and the, I can't help you if you need the rock, baby. You know it. <laughs> Everybody got devices? Get locked in every time we go live on our on, on our episodes each and every each and every week on Fridays. Y'all get that notification bell. Get locked in. Get subscribed. We can't stop. We, we won't, won't stop. stop. It's the Fan View Podcast. G Sports, man. Coach Hurricane Hen. You back at it again? I was trying to I was trying to come up with a Muslim name for G. Chill out. Struggling. Chill out. You know what I'm saying? My barber, Rasheed Sports. Shut up. He's found it out. <laughs>Construction is here for you with a brand new offer. We now provide affordable storage sheds. Stop wasting your money on overpriced storage units and portable containers. Step Construction can provide you with a custom shed that will fit your budget and storage needs. So contact Step Construction today at 504 340 5809 for your own personal quote. Let us help you take the next step at Step Construction. It's that boy Fred, host of FanView Podcast. Tune into the NOTN app. Weekdays, 3.30 for the FanView Podcast. Go to NewOrleansTalkNetwork.com to watch more episodes of FanView Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and watch.